Hello. Hey. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's give folks a few more minutes to join us. I apologize for the technical difficulties that we are experiencing this afternoon, uh, but we will get started in just a sec here. Okay, uh, I think we've got most folks. I'm not seeing anyone else in the waiting room. Uh, Laura, I will uh, ask you to uh, keep an eye on our waiting room um, while we get started and let anybody else in. Um, again, huge, huge apologies for uh, the uh, technical difficulties uh, this afternoon and the slightly late start, but thank you all for bearing with us. Um, we will go ahead and uh, get started with our March Early Childhood Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, thank you all so much for being here with us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to do a quick roll call um, and then um, we will uh, jump right in. All right. Um, Let's see, Cecilia. Here. Jennifer. Here, sorry, I had to unmute. All right. <laughs> Clark. I am here. Jennifer Parrish. Okay. Uh, let's see. Bev Yokum. Here. Kristen Johnson. Here. Sharice Rosario. Here. Shaki Franklin. Here. Angela Rouse. Here. Uh, Daryl Turner. Here. Gina Wolford. Here. Vivian McMahon. Here. Michelle Howard. Here. Miriam Sharifian. Here. Gwikia uh, Fosterstein. Here. Uh, Bergen Nelson. I think Bergen was going to miss today. Uh, Sandy Wilberger. Here. Taryn McCoy. Here. Uh, Sarah Cook. Here. Grace Creasy. Here. Roberta Newman. Here. And Angela Wirt. Here. And then um, I saw Jennifer Parrish. Did you log in? I just did. Thank you. And Cheryl Mormon. Here. Great. All right. So I think we are all set and we have a quorum. Uh, Laura, can you move us to the next slide? And the next slide, please. Uh, so Kia was not able to uh, to join us uh, last week, and I wanted to make sure she had the opportunity to uh, introduce herself. Uh, Kia, if you just want to share um, your name, uh, your uh, uh, what you do now, um, the uh, organization or, or group that you're representing on the committee, um, and then uh, anything else you'd like us to know um, about what brought you here, and if you want to tell us a little bit about um, your adorable childhood photo. 
So hi, everybody. My name is Boykia Steen. I will be back in my house in about 20 minutes, but I have to pick up my daughter from school. So please forgive me for being in my car. Um, I'm an associate professor at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, and I am serving as a faculty um, member on this committee. Um, my picture is a kindergarten picture. I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, I am from the South and um, that was my kindergarten picture uh, that uh, you, my mom has all, yes, that I had to go back and look at the picture. She has always loved um, bows and things, lace and things like that. So yes, that is she definitely, <laughs> that picture represents um, my mom. Um, but was there anything else I was supposed to say? No, that's perfect, Kia. Thanks so much. Um, All right. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Um, Laura, can you move to the next slide, please? All right, so um, I am now gonna turn it over to Jenna, um, who will announce our, uh, our uh, chair, uh, and then we can um, get going with the rest of our agenda. Jenna? Excellent, good afternoon, everyone. Kia, thank you for sharing that story. Having spent six years in Baton Rouge, I can appreciate uh, the, the big bows. And, 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 you know, not only did your mom get it in, but it was sort of able to, you were to make it to school and make it for the picture. I was astounded how um, uh, some of the most incredible moms get the bows in the hair and that they would stay in the hair, even when um, the little girl was upside down on the monkey bars. So not, not, not a, not a, not a small feat. Um, I am super pleased to welcome you to our second Early Childhood Advisory Committee meeting. Um, and today, very pleased to announce um, our new Early Childhood Advisory Committee chairperson. So again, um, last time we talked about needing a chairperson we, in consultation with the president of our Board of Education, uh, Mr. Dan Gecker, we have named a chair and I'm very pleased to introduce to you Shaikhi Franklin, who will be our new chairperson of um, our Early Childhood Advisory Committee. Shaikhi comes to us from uh, as a Head Start director um, uh, across the state. I think she's originally from Emporia, um, uh, Virginia native, um, and has done an incredible job both in terms of working at Head Start programs, but also representing Head Start and Early Head Start um, at the uh, state level on the School Readiness Committee meeting, impact work group and other groups. So with that, I'm going to uh, do two things. One, I'm gonna turn it over to Shaikhi to say uh, words, and then I'm also gonna consult with the five-year-old assistant who appears to have come into to my screen as well. But Shaikhi, we would love to hear a few words from there uh, and then we'll get right into the agenda. Thank you, Jenna. It's such a bonus to see your five-year-old addition to the screen. So um, good afternoon. And again, welcome to our second Early Childhood Advisory Council meeting. And I am excited to be serving as the chair. Um, today, we have one major topic on our agenda, uh, but want to get started uh, as a presentation and discussion is likely to take the majority of our time together. So we're going to go ahead and get started without further ado. Um, so with that, I offer a motion to approve today's agenda as presented on the screen. Um, this is Gina Wolford. I'll make the motion. Second. Motion has been made and properly second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it and the agenda has been approved. I will now turn it back over to Jenna to get started with the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Shaiki. Just important to get a little guidance from, from the five-year-old before we go into a, a big presentation. So I, I feel ready now, um, but 
uh, in all seriousness, I, I joined the, the chat comments um, and just the excitement um, having uh, Shaiki as our chair. Uh, so we talked a little bit about this last time, but we are going to dive full in um, to content in the second meeting. It was incredible to get to know everybody in the, the last meeting, um, and already we have big things on our plate. What I am excited to present to you today is our our, our proposal for Virginia's new Unified Measurement and Improvement System. I want to give a few heads up before we jump into the slides. First of all, I want to thank everybody who contributed to this work. Um, this really, as I'll talk a little bit throughout the presentation, reflects incredible work on the behalf of state employees, both at Department of Education, Department of Social Services, that goes back years colleagues across the state, Virginia Quality, Head Start, Child Care, our first preschool development grant, preschool development grant birth to five, Virginia Early Childhood Foundation, Elevate Early Education, Voices, the Child Care Association, the Family Day Home Association, um, Virginia Early Childhood Foundation, um, higher ed colleagues um, across the state. I see Commissioner Storen. Um, I know that kind of just leaders across Virginia have helped us get to this place today um, and wanted to kind of thank everybody. I will, for continuity purposes, present all of this, but please know that many people contributed. Also on our team, folks like Chris Myers and Pamela and Aaron, just a, a tremendous amount of work um, went into this. It is a lot of information, um, and there are a lot of words on the slide. We sent this to you a week in advance knowing um, that it was a lot, right? Both the slides that I'll go through today and the document, the proposal document, um, and we recognize it's a lot of information. We felt that providing that background, that full introduction plus that level of detail is important, but we do, we acknowledge it's a lot. Um, and just wanted to remind you that this is a proposal, right? That kind of what we're seeking today is your endorsement on this. You'll hear me throughout the day talk about this as a practice year, and that's really important, right, that we look at this. We're working on a proposal right now for our first practice year. We're going to have two full practice years, and we're going to work through with you throughout the course of the next few years to get this uniform measurement and improvement system to a place where we like. So, um, you know, we didn't mean to kind of overwhelm with the second meeting out of the gate, but we really wanted to make sure you had all the information at your fingertips, fingertips, but please remember that this is a proposal for a practice year, um, and there's a lot of term, to, a lot of uh, time to, to learn and grow. What we're doing today, and I'm going to walk us through this. Uh, feel free to pop questions in the chat as as we go, and probably kind of if there's any clarifying questions, I'll answer them throughout. But otherwise, probably save the more substantive questions for the end for our discussion. Um, uh, and you know, we realize it's a it's a lot of information, um, uh, but that you know we we want to make sure that we kind of share everything that we've thought through um, as as we go, um, you know. And as you'll hear me say, you know, throughout this, in terms of this being practiced, like we also get that room wasn't built in a day, right? Like there's just we're, this is for a subset of communities. It's a little bit more than a pilot. You know, we've piloted for the last two years. Now we're trying to get to a larger scale. Um, but we also we recognize that we're going to continue to need to learn from the field to come back to you multiple times over the course of the next few years um, as we as we go forward. So I'm going to jump into the presentation. Also note that we did have an online survey in addition to our formal kind of public comments. So I'll share that also at the end after my, the presentation, and then we'll get into kind of the questions and discussions. With that, let's go to the next slide, please. One more, please, Laura. So what we will up, take it back one, sorry. No. So what we're going to try to achieve over the course of our time together is to make sure that everybody is clear on the purpose, goals, and implementation plan for year one of, this, of the, the practice year one for Virginia's new required unified measurement and improvement system. Ultimately, ultimately we would like your endorsement. And so we'll do a vote at, at the end. Um, 
we recognize that you'll provide feedback along the way and you may want to sort of endorse with recommendations. There might be specific things that you want to make sure that we pay attention to or we look at further. And so we also kind of welcome that, but we will seek an endorsement so that when we take this to the board um, in April, that we can say we're doing it with the endorsement of this new very important Early Childhood Advisory Committee. I will take us through the background first, kind of what got us to this place and why we think it's so important to build a uniform measurement and improvement system in Virginia. I'll talk in more detail about what's included in the proposal and how it will work in practice year one. We'll then talk in, you know, uh, in greater detail about how programs will be supported to improve. And you'll hear me use these words measurement and improvement throughout this. This is not just about measurement. This is really about how do we do good measurement so that we can truly support all of our programs and all of our educators to be successful. And so we'll talk in detail about that. We'll then get to uh, brass tacks about how we will support this, specifically what funding and resources will be available to the field um, and how we'll make sure that you know, we're supporting our programs to make this happen next year. I'll then to speak to some of the public feedback we've gotten so far, some of the strengths that they've noticed, some of the challenges they've raised, and then we'll kind of go into discussion as an advisory committee. Next slide, please. As a reminder, and I believe we shared this with you when we spoke last month, but our focus here and what the board is now charged with, and we're thinking about in our advisory committee, we're advising them on this challenge, is that not all children in the Commonwealth have the opportunity to come to school ready, right? And this goes beyond just literacy and early math, right? This is sort of whole child literacy, math, social skills, self-regulation. Um, our system doesn't provide equitable access to opportunity. Um, and we know that too many kids are coming in not ready and we look at more detail about who doesn't have the opportunity to be ready, too often zip code or socioeconomic status or race or ability status predicts whether you have that opportunity to come to school ready. Part of this is a function of, of access, right? We, we rank low nationally in terms of funding preschool. We don't fund childcare at the cost of quality or family in our family day home. And so we've got some work to do there in terms of increasing access for families. But we also know we have challenges on quality. Um, largely right now that we don't know what we don't know and that most of our programs that take public dollars, we don't have good information on what kids are experiencing. And all of this has been exacerbated by the last year now, it's hard to believe we're saying last year, um, and this, pen, this global pandemic and the disparate way in which it's exacerbated inequities. Um, and really, as I was just speaking earlier this week, the superintendents spoke earlier today on a webinar Right, we know we have a lot of children missing from our system right now. We know we have a lot of young children, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers facing extreme stressors, right? Or and and so this challenge um, is greater now than ever. Um, and you know, it is our work and the board's work to figure out step by step, right? How do we keep hope and continue to tackle it? Next slide, please. So with that, let's talk about how we think the measurement and improvement system can address particularly the quality aspect of this challenge. So as I said before, right now our system doesn't offer every child equitable opportunity. Um, and that we know that, that early childhood can work, right? In the incredible diverse array of providers and practitioners we have on this group, as well as our academic experts and others who can speak to this. And yet right now, um, the system, you know, doesn't prepare all kids and there's real disparities in who has access. So to address this, what we need to do is together ensure that all children have access to high quality teaching and learning experiences across the setting, family day home, child care, private providers, Head Start and early Head Start school based providers that meet their unique needs. We will talk today about kind of three steps. Uh, towards reaching that goal, the first of which is unifying. Um, and we talked a little bit about last time, we have lots of different letters and funding source and types of programs, and we must come together and unified around shared and equitable expectations for quality. 
There's no single provider amongst us can serve all kids birth to five, particularly our most vulnerable kids and families. And so we're going to have to come together, and that means we need to unify. Second, we need to measure and strengthen two key components of teaching and learning, our teacher-child interactions and our use of curriculum in all of our publicly funded programs, because we know our publicly funded programs serve some of our most vulnerable kids and families. And finally, um, as we get that information from the measurement, we have to use it, we have to combine it with real investment, real resources to make sure that we align and strengthen our support or improve our support for our educators. We believe in every educator who's part of our system. We know that these educators have been on the front lines, dealing with change, dealing with stress, incredible work over the last year. And it's our obligation as a system to figure out how do we recognize their strengths, how do we sort of identify the areas for growth and opportunity, and how do we get them resources to support them to be better tomorrow than they are today, to improve and enhance and strengthen their practice so they can support kids to thrive. Next slide, please. This gives you a sense of the background that got to today. It was so fantastic last time we met to hear about everybody's individual backgrounds and to hear some of these points noted. And I think that's really important, right? This system is greater than any of us, right? And, um, and that this represents many years of work, step-by-step -step progress, tackling this very large challenge. But we have and our, from our Head Start partners more than a decade, right, really since the School Readiness Act, was passed on strengthening practice, professionalizing their educators, changing the kind of face and perception of Head Start. We have our private providers and our VPI programs that made big investment in Virginia quality. We know JLARC went off and sort of you know, did a new, huge analysis of early childhood a few years ago, found some strengths, found some challenges. We've received multiple federal grants, including the preschool development grant, which the vast majority of those dollars have gone to communities and to educators, right, to help us chart this path. Doesn't make sense to, you know, try to you know, build all these systems and define all these things from Richmond. We need to learn from those who are closest to children. And then most recently with our current governor and first lady and their considering early childhood a priority, set forth executive directive four, sent Dr. Lane, Commissioner Storen, and myself around the state to hear from more than 300 diverse individuals about how we could work together better to improve school readiness, measure and support quality, increase access, and ultimately create a commonwealth with more equitable opportunity for all young learners. And that led to the unification law that was passed a year ago, signed by the governor last summer, that basically does three things. One of which is create this incredible body, this Early Childhood Advisory Committee. The second of which is moves oversight of all of the various functions of child care, family day homes, Head Start collaboration to the Board of Education and the Department of Education. And the third piece, which is what we're going to talk about today, is it requires Virginia to create a uh, uniform measurement and improvement system that's mandatory for all publicly funded providers. So. This proposal that we'll take to the board really is the, the manifestation of that, right? How we will take that law and put it into, into action over the course of the next few years, right? Remembering that we're starting with practice. Next slide, please. So again, you're gonna be like, if we could just take a tally of every time I say practice, but I want to kind of clarify what I mean or what we mean when we say practice, and you saw it throughout the document that you received as well. Initially, the law that was passed last year called for one practice year. Um, as you'll remember, the General Assembly ended in 2020 right before the pandemic hit, so we had no idea what was about to, to, to befall us, but so it called for one practice year. We realized pretty uh, early last summer, right, that we would need more time, right, that the field was still recovering from the pandemic. And so we changed the law this session under a governor, gubernatorial bill to make sure we have two full years of practice. So the 21-22 year um, and the 22-23 year will be practice, right? No stakes, no consequences. They won't be public reporting. Um, we will share the results with programs so they can understand how they would look under the new system, um, but it is it is for practice purposes only. This is important, right, because 
programs will say, what does this mean for me? And we'll be able to actually go through all of the steps as though it was real, but it'll be practice, right? It's like a dry run or a dress rehearsal. It also is important for our purposes, the Early Child Advisory Committee and the board and the department, because it means we can learn from you. We can learn from the data that we get from the field. And we'll talk a little bit more about that data today. We can hear from people, right? We're not, we're not kind of rushing through this. We can talk to practitioners. Some of the concerns that we've heard already about what this means for people, we'll be able to go slowly and learn from them as we go. And then we can make changes or tweak or strengthen the system. So by the time it becomes real, um, that we can, have, we can have anticipated and addressed some of those concerns that I know will even come up today. Next slide, please. One other key point when we sort of talk about the practice here is sort of, well, who's going to be doing this, right? And I know we've got some folks that will be really sort of focused on the theoretical and the abstract. I don't have other folks to the doers on the phone, like who concretely is going to do these things? And so I want to make sure that everybody understands when we talk about the local communities that are doing this work this year, who we're talking about. We have, Virginia has over the last few years used federal funding, so we didn't have to take away from any work that was ongoing. This was new federal funding to pilot what we thought might be happening, right? So we took preschool development grant birth, five, birth to five. Sometimes I might refer to it as PDG B5 or PDG. Um, and we provided these resources to uh, local communities across the state to begin to do these things. We also worked very closely, and I see some members here on this in this meeting, around a strategic plan and a needs assessment, right, so that we could kind of come together in addition to the work on Executive Directive 4, and then identify what work did we want to ask communities to, to do so we could learn from these communities. So some of these folks have been at this work for more than two years, but the communities that you see highlighted here on this map these are the cohort one and the cohort two. So these are the communities, the cities and the counties um, that will be a part of practice year uh, one. They will receive resources to do the observations, to give us the data, to complete some of these activities. Um, and again, for many of these folks and these providers, they've already been doing this. Um, and we are bringing on an additional cohort three. Um, so we'll have between 60 and 70% of the state participating in practice year one. Um, and again, you know, they'll be receiving resources to do this. So when we think about who is doing this next year, who is going to be a part of practice year one, really try to remember this map, put it in your brain. These are the areas um, in which this work will be happening. Uh, if your community is not currently on there, it means that you'll have likely the opportunity to do it in practice year two. So we are not going to, because of the pandemic, because of everything going on, we're not going to go full state scale in practice year one. That's partly why we added that second practice year. Our goal is to make sure that the full state has the opportunity in the second year and in this first year to start with those communities that have opted in um, and are, are in a better position to, to take these steps this year. Specifically, here's what those communities are doing. Um, and again, we are learning so much. For, so for those of you on the phone who have been leaders, have been a part of our work with our preschool development grant community, huge thank you to you all. Here are some of the activities that we've been funding them to do. And as you think about these activities and what I'll describe later, you'll, you will see why these groups are in such a good place to implement in this year. So we have funded and asked community leads across the state to first to bring together all of our publicly funded programs. This includes our school-based preschool, our Head Start and Early Head Start partners, our child care centers, particularly those that are subsidy vendors or take the subsidy program, and our family day homes, right, particularly those that take the subsidy program. We have said first, the important thing, if we're going to do a lot of work together, right, we need to build relationships and really kind of moving outside of program type or kind of those silos to working together. Secondly, we've worked to kind of get accurate information from all of those programs down to the classroom level, which is a really big feat when you think about sort of the level to which all of our programs are really connected and kind of on the grid. Um, so some work there to make sure we can get information down to the classroom level from all of these programs. We've asked these communities to observe all classrooms twice a year 
provide feedback to teachers and provide us with that observation data and to collect other key points, uh, pieces of quality data so that we have that in one portal, both for the community purposes, but also for the statewide data. And we're able to use that statewide data to design a system that makes the most sense for Virginia. They've also begun using that data to support improvement and really thinking through how do we engage families at every step in the way. And that was a big effort that has kind of come out of this. In the beginning, we were really focused on relationships, access and quality, and then realized that we needed to also pay real attention to family engagement and how we sort of engage families and how they're making choices, how they're enrolling, and how they are supporting their children's learning and development along with educators. And last but not least, and I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, we've also been piloting an innovative educator incentive, particularly for our educators in childcare and family day homes that take public funds to really recognize them for the incredible work, for the big changes that this means for them in terms of being observed and getting feedback as they become part of this system and to help reduce turnover, knowing that it's really hard to strength and quality if 40% of your educators are leaving each year. And so I'll talk more about that, but all of this has been happening in these communities that we're gonna ask to take on the work of the practice year next year. Next slide, please. One of the key things that's been true for our work with communities is at least once a quarter, we meet with them, we provide some technical assistance, and we, we spend a lot of time engaging with them and learning with them on what's working, what's not, and that's really important. So much of what we're, we're proposing today has been influenced by them. But our PDG communities are not the only ones who have influenced this proposal. And I wanna just take a moment to recognize all of the stakeholders that we've been able to engage even um, since the, the law was passed um, and we've been doing this planning and working in partnership with the field so we've done now two webinars um, and had sort of several hundred folks participate and then nearly 1600 views of that first webinar we've done a survey and got nearly 150 responses in response to the first webinar we have another live survey now and kind of capturing feedback We've gone around the state, mostly virtual, due to the constraints of the pandemic, but really meeting with and, and hearing from all sorts of stakeholder groups. We've done listening sessions to just for us to stop talking. And I know it's kind of hard to believe with all the talking I'm going to do today, but to really hear from folks on what quality means to them, why that matters, where we've been good at supporting, what additional things they need. Um, and then we continue to consult with experts in and out of the state. Um, on data, on content, on equity, how do we build a system? How do we take the lessons learned from Virginia as well as from states across the country and build the best possible system for Virginia? We are keeping this information on our new Building a Unified Early Childhood System website, and we also use our readiness connections. So if you haven't signed up from that, please make sure that you do. Um, but just want you to make sure that we are building this in partnership with you in partnership with our communities, our pioneering local communities, as well as other diverse stakeholders across the state. And we will continue to kind of come back with you and update you in all of the engagement that we're doing. Next slide, please. With that, um, I want to now sort of shift into, well, what are we proposing, right? So what I've said so far is we've got a shared challenge around preparing kids for kindergarten and really our theory of change or our belief system that is if we can improve the teaching and learning experiences across those diverse experiences that kids have, but ideally also increase the number of kids that are served in those experiences by supporting those educators, right, to continually improve, we can build a system that puts more kids on track for um, success. I then said that we're we're well positioned to pilot right our best approach for that system because we've we've invested in our communities, our communities are leading the way, and that the proposal brought to you really reflects diverse stakeholder input. Through the process so far, what we've found is it's really also important to lay out our values, right? This is a multi-year iterative process, and we need not only a strong theory of change, right, a model what we think is going to work and why but also some values or some guiding principles to value, um, to kind of keep us uh, on our path as we go forward. So through this process, a few key points have really 
bubbled up or sort of been um, really kind of important um, to our stakeholders, to our to the field, to our practitioners. And I want to just reflect those uh, to keep in the back of your head or in your mind as we go through the, the proposal today. So the first of um, these key proposals is that we need a system that really helps improve quality and results in better outcomes for children. And that's really important, right? At the heart of this work is how do we help put more kids on track for success and ensure that more kids have, you know, valuable, insightful, meaningful early childhood experiences, right? And we know we can do that across all settings. And that's got to be kind of the true north of our work. We know in this work, we have to increase equity. And we think about that in two aspects. Obviously, we would like for every kid to have equitable opportunity to come to kindergarten ready. And that race or zip code or socioeconomics don't predict your likelihood of having that opportunity to come ready. But the how we get there also matters. And you'll hear us talk a little bit about this today. But the process, who we're engaging, how we're designing the system, making sure we're not just designing this for the kid or the family or the program that has access to resources, but who is furthest from opportunity and how do we make sure that they're at the table guiding and informing this process every step of the way. We know we are going to need to find measures that distinguish levels of quality and we have to have a real focus on growth. Um, you know, each of us, we, we know it's not a fully level playing field in, in, in early childhood, like that is the truth of the matter. There's the history of early childhood in this country, right? There are the inequities and the disparities, you know, and there's no sort of easy way to level that playing field. On the other hand, we fundamentally believe that every kid has sort of the opportunity to grow and fulfill their potential, and every educator can strengthen and improve her practice, right? And we have to build a system focused on growth, right? Not just kind of one point in time and calling it one and done. We really need to make sure we provide clear and actionable information to every level of the system, right? And that we think about the resources to support folks to be a effective and those incentives to grow um, and to thrive. It needs to be affordable. I know this was a lesson learned kind of nationally, right? We came up with all of these bells and whistles and these, these systems a decade ago, and many of them were cost prohibitive. And it was inadvertently, we created a little bit of a pay to play system where if you wanted to reach the highest level of quality, you had to make investments that many of our programs couldn't afford. And these were the very same programs that often served our low income and our moderate income families. And so that wasn't fair to those families and not fair to those programs. And ultimately, guys, we're talking about big numbers. And I think that's really important. I know that each of us in our head, when we first think of quality, we think of like one program, right? And if we are running that program or if we have a kid or a grandkid or a niece or nephew in that program, what we want. But I will remind us throughout our conversation today as we go forward, we're talking about ballpark 6,000 programs, right, and 10,000 classrooms. And so really recognizing what's so awesome about this group is the very diversity of this small group, but it's an incredibly diverse sector. And so being really thoughtful about how do we do something that we can do with a lot of educators, a lot of classrooms, right, a lot of programs to be fair and consistent, right, focused on growth, um, and again, with keeping kids at the center, our youngest kids, our infants, our toddlers, and our pre preschoolers, excuse me, at the center of this work. So with that, let's go to the next slide. So that's the preamble. That probably covers a lot of what was in the early section of that document, the why, the landscape, the key values that we bring to this work. Again, reminder, right, that sort of those are very lofty, um, uh, lofty, lofty values, and we're not going to be able to build Rome in a day, right? So this is just practice year one. But as we think about the steps towards getting there, want to make sure that we all have the same true north in mind and that we have these shared values to guide our work. So let's get into the details for practice year one, which again will involve those communities that we highlighted on the map earlier. So we propose largely kind of based on what we've learned um, in the field in Virginia and what the national research suggests that we focus on the quality of, of measuring the quality of infant, toddler, and preschool teaching and learning based on two nationally recognized quality indicators. The first is interactions. So we will measure teacher-child interactions and instruction in a developmentally appropriate way 
using a nationally regarded tool, the Classroom Assessment Scoring System, or sort of for shorthand known as the CLASS. We will also measure the use of approved curricula that are aligned with our new early learning and development standards. So those two core components that we want to see in all of our publicly funded classrooms, the high quality interactions and instruction and the use of um, curriculum. We are proposing that you do this because we know if we can bring these two elements, right, and then sort of improve the ways in which those indicators are used in all of our classrooms that we um, can promote children's holistic learning and development, right? And by providing those higher quality experiences, we increase the opportunity and uh, address some of the disparities in terms of school readiness. Um, and again, this is our infant, toddler, and our preschool classrooms and our publicly funded programs. Next slide, please. I'm now going to take us into each of those two elements, right? So I'm going to start with element number one, measuring interactions. Next slide, please. So what is the class? So as I said before, there's kind of these two key components of teaching and learning in our infant, toddler, and preschool classrooms. And the way in which we're going to measure the first one, interactions, we're going to use the classroom assessment scoring system. This is a nationally recognized observation tool that was developed to be used across different age bands. We will propose using three in the practice year one, the infant class, the toddler class, and the preschool class. I should note that we can also use class in mixed age settings, so some of our family day homes, and we're working right now on the guidance, depending on kind of the ages of the kids serve, which tool you would use. Um, we support the class one because it's nationally recognized, but it also is very age focused and it measures multiple aspects of age and developmentally appropriate teacher child interactions that support an infant's learning and development, which looks quite different from a three or four year old. For those of you who aren't familiar with the class, it is basically an in person or a video observation. So either somebody comes in or video is captured. For infants, it's 60 minutes, it's for 15 minute cycle, and for preschoolers and toddlers, it's for 20 minute cycle. So really in the classroom, capturing what the young learners are experiencing. And there is a lot of structure around who can do class observation. So as we think about how do we do this across thousands of classrooms statewide, and how do we make sure that we have consistent information or an apples to apples information, we can rely on some of this structure. So anybody who wants to observe using the class must be trained. It's roughly a two day training um, and found reliable, which means that you need to be able to score a set of videos um, and come close enough to um, the, the right score or kind of an accurate uh, reflection of what's going on before you can complete observations and we'll make we'll talk a little bit more about this later but we'll we'll spend a lot of, of effort making sure that folks are getting accurate feedback right because in order to grow as an educator you need to first sort of first start with accurate feedback next slide please With that in mind here's our why so here are the the rationale that really, we felt sort of the strongest rationale for um, measuring the interactions using this particular tool. So the first one is the why for interactions. And we know that at the heart of our work, right, no matter what your background, no matter what your education credential, whether you're in a family day home, a child care, a school, a preschool, a faith-based center preschool, a Head Start program and a community action agency, across all of those settings, what forms the foundation for children's um, learning and growth is the adult, the relationships and the interactions that they have with their educators. More than 200 studies across the country show that children in classrooms with higher quality interactions as measured by the class have better outcomes. So in other words, a child who has the opportunity to be in a class with, a high, with higher quality interactions is likely to grow more or learn more than a child in, in a comparable classroom. We also know that improving interactions can help improve children's outcomes, right? So we don't ever want to propose a system in which we would directly assess kids. Like nobody anywhere wants sort of standardized tests of toddlers, but this is a good way to approximate and potentially predict which, how we get to our classrooms that are more likely to prepare kids and have those positive child outcomes that true north uh, in terms of our guiding principles. 
We also know that class can be used in diverse settings with our dual language learners, children with special needs, um, and all children, right, regardless of background, experience, ability, status, or language spoken, can benefit from high quality adult child interactions. Um, and we have a long history of class um, in, in the state um, and have used it really across settings Virginia Quality, Head Start, VPI, Preschool Development Grant, the first round for more than a decade, um, and really feel like it's the ideal thing when we think about scaling to, again, 6,000 programs and 10,000 classrooms across the state. There's a lot more detail about the class in the document, and there's some links here. Um, and so if at any point if there are questions there, we can certainly provide you the bibliography and all of the information on this particular tool. Next slide, please. The uh, how we will, will we measure interactions in practice year one, and so the kind of the key point here is that we will be funding our pioneering communities, those PDG communities, to make sure that every classroom receives at least two class observations and individualized feedback. And again, that's across all infant, toddler, and pre uh, pre-K classrooms. They will receive resources to do a fall and spring observation, um, and then we will capture that data using the data portal that we've set up with these communities, which is known as Link B5. So those observations will fund folks to have, to have, to have those happen locally, um, and they've been building that capacity for the, the greater part of the last two years. We have sort of thousands of class observers across the state. We will also, uh, uh, set aside some funding to do external class observations, so those provided by the state, as a way to kind of compare across communities. So as we're working towards a shared goal of providing accurate feedback to all educators, we'll have a small investment there. What this means for all of those educators participating in practice year one is that they'll receive some foundational training. So if they haven't already, understanding what is expected in terms of teacher-child interactions, um, they'll re receive observations, and then they will receive specific feedback based on their strengths and their areas from growth, and then they will receive um, aligned support uh, in order to improve their practice. Next slide, please. Who will conduct the class observations? And this is a, a, a critical point because this is part of, as you'll hear me talk about at the end, our strategy on improvement. We are going to fund our local communities to do these observations. So there will be some flexibility and who a community um, designates to do these observations. That's important as we think about getting to scale um, and making sure we have enough capacity to support improvement. So you'll have to be certified on the class tool. You'll have to have passed the reliability assessment um, and have the kind of reliability You'll have to follow observation protocols set forth by the state, but there will be some flexibility um, and who can do those observations, whether it's the principal, whether it's a, a coordinator, whether it's um, somebody else locally, there'll be quite a bit of flexibility for our communities. Um, as I said before, in addition, we'll send out some folks from the state as a way to kind of compare across communities, but the vast majority of these observations will be having locally and making sure in these practice years as we go into the real system, we have enough capacity to observe, right, when we get to steady state, uh, 10,000 classrooms um, statewide. It's also critically important that this is a little bit different from many measurement and improvement systems where they only do a sample of classrooms. We wanna get every classroom because we believe every educator really needs feedback um, to understand her strengths or his strengths and have that kind of opportunity to get that individualized um, support. So, it does mean a lot of work up front, and it will take us a few years to kind of get to, to full scale here. But you know, while a sample might give you a good approximation of what you're likely to experience at that site, a sample doesn't really help every educator. And our goal here to support improvement down to the classroom in every last classroom re requires building the capacity to observe every classroom twice a year. Next slide, please. We know it, I noted a little bit earlier, right, about sort of the stark disparities that are part of our shared challenge and our work together. I also talked a little bit about from both a process perspective and an outcome perspective, how we feel it's really strongly that our system not only doesn't sort of, you know, further exacerbate inequities, but actually helps to tackle them. So I wanted to just take a moment to speak to how we see potentially class helping to address some of those disparities. Um, 
we looked at the data um, from the kind of the current system. Um, and what we found currently is a lot of our quality measurement systems that put a high priority, for instance, on teacher credential end up inadvertently um, on having a disparate effect, right? And we saw, for example, if you have a credential requirement similar to what we currently have um, in Virginia Quality, it means that many of our family day homes are would be considered on the lower end of the quality spectrum relative to our schools and our Head Start programs, which have bachelor's degree requirements. However, when we took those very same programs and looked at something like measuring interactions, what we saw is that childcare and family day homes that would otherwise be considered low end of the, of the spectrum move right up there, right? We're able to demonstrate high quality interactions even without necessarily having that credential. And considering that oftentimes that credential, there may have not have been equitable access to it. It's costly, right? Families might have the same opportunities to build um, assets and be able to afford higher education. We really wanted to make sure that our system didn't inadvertently say, right, that, you know, that those um, educators are higher quality than um, other ones that may not have had equitable opportunity. So, you know, that's that middle bullet there in terms of using class provides our equitable opportunities for educators to improve their practice, regardless of their background, their educational preparation, or the setting in which they work. We also know um, that class can be used across a diversity of settings, right? And it's used in kind of across the country, with um, you know, an incredible array of kids and that the research base there really demonstrates that it can be used with all types of kids and infants, toddlers and preschoolers. And that's also really important. We have seen historically how some of our assessments can be extremely biased, right? And sort of, and, and create um, sort of a deficit, a deficit approach that we don't want here. Um, we uh, also know that there's going to be some work to do on this, right? That class is, is, is not perfect, right, as many evaluation tools are. And so we plan and have started work and will continue to partner with our PDG communities on how do we make sure um, that we're using this in a culturally and linguistically sensitive way? How do we make sure when we think of some of our inclusionary settings and our self-contained settings, right, that this tool is being used to support all learners and recognizes the unique needs of those learners and why those classrooms might look slightly differently than other classrooms. Um, and we continue to want to work with Cheryl and all of our family day homes on how to make sure that we are recognizing the incredible strength that they are um, and that they too are educators, right, the setting looks a little different. Um, um, but it is really important, and we think that class, as we saw in some of the data we looked at from Virginia, can really demonstrate the strengths of our family day homes um, and help to dispel some of those myths that you have to be in a school or you have to be in a big center to be quality. We don't believe that to be true, and we think class can help build that case. Uh, we just want to make sure when we sort of do this, right, with a large number of family day homes, that we're doing that thoughtfully. And again, as we do this work, that's why we'll need the two practice years to make sure that we're thoughtful with all of our more vulnerable populations of both uh, kids and educators. With that, uh, if we'll go to the next slide, Laura, I'm gonna switch now and talk about our second key measure. So our first one was interactions using a nationally regarded measure, the class system of uh, measures to evaluate our infant, toddler, and preschool classrooms, a big investment locally to get two observations for every educator so we can provide them feedback and align support, and some real thoughtfulness about how we use this in a way that increases equity and reduces disparities. Our second key measure of teaching and learning, what we'll propose that we capture for the practice year, is measuring curriculum. Laura, if you can take us to the next slide, I'll describe how we'll do that. So similar to what we presented in the last section, sort of Juan explained the why, like why you why measure the use of curriculum. Um, and there's a couple of key points from the research. Again, there's more detail in the document, um, so I won't kind of read through this, but the key point is we want to provide our educators with tools across our infant, toddler, and preschool classrooms that really supports them to support kids to learn um, and grow and thrive. We will support the use of curriculum that are aligned with our new early learning development standards, right, which cover all aspects of kids learning development. This is way more than letters and numbers, but is really looking at the holistic development of our infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. 
We know that quality curriculums can help support cultural and linguistic diversity. Our young learners are more diverse than they've ever been in Virginia, and it's important that the instructional materials and how we uh, teach and educate and support them meets the needs of their culture and their language spoken. Um, and we know that sort of that we have some great studies that using kind of class and curriculum together can really help drive better child outcomes, right? So that intentionality, this real thoughtfulness about what do I want to support a kid to learn and grow and be able to do with this day or with this hour or with this time slot tied with a kind of a clear measure of what high quality interactions look like, we think can be a real game changer for our programs across the state. Next slide, please. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about how we will measure the use of curriculum in practice year one. And again, a really key point here that this is practice year one. This is not necessarily how we're going to measure it forever. But what we are proposing as a first step in getting and supporting our programs to use curriculum um, is that we will recognize and provide points, and I'll talk about it in a second, for all sites that use an approved curriculum, so in a, a, a curriculum approved by the Department of Education in at least one classroom during practice year two, one, excuse me. Um, so again, that's at least one classroom. So we are not saying all classrooms in the first practice year, and I'll explain why, but it largely has to do with our current starting point and it not fully being a level playing field. We are also going to give classrooms until May um, to be able to, to, to demonstrate that they're using in at least one classroom. We know we've got materials that we need to review at the state level. We know um, that folks need, might need some time and support to implement curriculum. And so we're going to give a, a multiple months into almost the full school year um, for folks to be able to kind of earn those points. Um, and we'll capture this through a self-reported mechanism in the Link B5 portal. So again, for all of those communities that you saw highlighted on the map, each of those directors and leaders will have access to a portal in which they can enter information about curriculum. We know this means that we can't guarantee that all educators will have access to curriculum in this first year. Um, and you know, that's a longer term goal, but our goal is to kind of take a step in that direction in this practice year to make sure that we make curriculum accessible and affordable to all of our programs and to start to get it in more of our classrooms, knowing that there's some disparities and how and access to curriculum right now. So this is a step one um, with the goal being kind of more and more classrooms over time using curriculum. Next slide, please. Wanna, some folks would say, well, what does an approved curriculum mean? So just wanna briefly speak to that. We are, we have worked for the last few years across some of our state programs to vet or review or approve curriculum. And we're gonna sort of solidify and formalize that process here at the department. That means that we will not only be able to review some of the ones that everybody's familiar with, what they call the kind of off the shelf products, which many of our Head Start and DPI programs are currently using, but we also, if you if programs or communities have developed their own resources, it means we will have the ability to review those. So we are, and I said this last week, last week in the webinar for the broader field, we are not asking anybody, anybody at this point in time to go out and buy anything. Please do not, you know, that should not be the message at all, right? What we want to do is take the few months, right, take this practice year to understand what folks are using. If it's not approved and they would like it to be reviewed, provide that opportunity. And if somebody is not using anything, we're going to be working as a state to figure out how we make affordable options available. And that's an important point, options. We are not looking to say there is one required curriculum. This is not what this is about. There will be an approved set of options that programs can choose for. Um, and what we'll be really looking at is how we make sure that there are at least some affordable options across those age bands. Next slide, please. As part of that approval process, we will be looking to cultural responsiveness. And I think this is really, really important. As I said before, our young learners are more diverse than ever. Um, and we really wanna make sure when they come into our programs, right, that they feel like the way in which they're supported to learn and grow is responsive to the language that they speak, the culture that they are 
the part of the village or the community, the greater family unit. And so we want to make sure that our curriculum that are approved support culturally responsive interactions, that they build on and encourage learning experiences that build on culture values and beliefs, and that the materials feel like they were made for those kids, right? That, they, you know, historically, we've not done a great job of that. You know, you sort of hear about some other research on there. Oftentimes, our materials feature white children, and then the sort of the next biggest count is, you know, animals, right? And then finally, we see, um, you know, depictions of children of color. And so we want to be really thoughtful as we approve curriculum and, and make options of, uh, affordable to the state, um, to our programs, that we do this in a way that's very culturally and linguistically responsible. Um, and we hope by elevating this and putting this as part of the process that we can make sure that all of our early learners, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers not only feel welcome, but really supported to thrive in their classrooms. Next slide, please. And that's a great way to sort of to echo this point in terms of in the same way that I walked us through our logic or how we're thinking about how we would use class to increase equity. Again, we see curriculum as a tool that can help reduce some of those disparities. We know that kids need intentional supports, and there are a lot of high quality materials out there. As I said before, this is not about trying to pick one resource for everybody, right? Educators have different preferences. Families and parents have different preferences, and we want to recognize those preferences. On the other hand, probably each of us has gone into a setting or a classroom before where maybe nothing is being used, right? And there is, you know, there's sort of the best of intentions, but you see a lot of missed out opportunities, right? Missed out opportunities to support the individual needs of kids, missed out opportunities to promote a particular skill or critical thinking activity. Um, and we don't think educators should have to make that all up, right? We know that oftentimes that's the pressure on educators' shoulders. And so we want to work as a system to identify good tools, culturally responsive, appropriate, rigorous, sort of thoughtful tools, and then to figure out how we get them out to site leaders and how those site leaders can then support their classrooms to use it. Some of our folks are already doing this, um, but we know that that's not necessarily true for some of our other programs, particularly our family day homes and some of our smaller child care centers. And so we think by including this, by only requiring it in one classroom in the beginning, um, and by really thinking through how we make it affordable for all, that we can help bring that intentional teaching and learning to all of our settings, right, which all of our kids um, deserve. So we do think this is an important step um, towards increasing equity, um, and we, we recognize that means there will be more resources from the state needed to actually execute that. Okay, so, and I should note, I feel like this is one of those things, honor system, if you need a break, rather than kind of having everybody take a break, please don't hesitate to kind of put up your stop video and, and, and take a break, get a sip of water, whatever you might need, deal with your three-year-old or five-year-old, whoever might come in the room. But um, as a reminder, I laid out the why, right, why we fundamentally think we need to support, measure and support improvement in all of our infant, toddler, and preschool classrooms. I then said that our proposal for year one would focus on two elements, interactions and curriculum. I talked about why interactions matter, how we think they sort of measuring and improving interactions can support equity, and how we'll do that in Virginia using the class, a tool that we've used for nearly a decade, can be used in all classrooms with infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, um, and that we'll be making big investments locally to support that uh, capacity so every observer can get observed at least twice a year and receive feedback and support to grow. I also said that the second element was looking at curriculum, not necessarily in all classrooms at once, right, because we are, we're not at the same starting point, but really thinking about how we make sure that there are options that have been vetted and approved by the state, culturally responsive and thoughtful, and that uh, we, over time, will make them affordable and accessible to all programs so that all educators have that opportunity to support their kids in an individualized way in a very intentional manner. So how will this work next year? So this gives you the timeline. Again, those communities that were highlighted on the map earlier, we, they're pretty used to some version of this timeline, but they'll receive the funds in the summer. They'll do the preparation for the year. They'll have a timeline to do the fall observations, a timeline to do the spring observations. They'll enter it all in that data portal, so we'll have all of that data and be able to kind of track our progress as they go. 
remember they'll have until May to enter that information about curriculum. You know, we know we've got some work to do and review. And then we'll take all of that data into sort of late spring, early summer, crunch all the numbers, and then share back with uh, the programs how they did, right? We'll provide them a calculator along the way so they can also crunch their own numbers if they want to kind of understand how they did, um, and we'll be meeting periodically with the communities as well as you all to share the data and the insights as we go. At the same time, we'll also be doing recruiting, and so in July of 2022, we'll begin practice year two, and our goal is to go from 60 to 70% of the state to all of the state on board for practice year two. Next slide, please. How will we calculate the, the measurement? So again, caveat at the beginning, the results are private, not consequences, nothing kind of attached to this, um, no, no penalties or anything related to these. We will share the results with program leaders so they understand before this thing rolls out what it might mean for them. Um, and we'll, we'll be able to look at the state level results, right, without any names attached to kind of understand the equity impact or how is it doing? Is it a fair system? Where are their challenges? The way in which we'll calculate the results for the practice year one is we'll take all of those, those fall and spring observations. So every classroom, every educator will get feedback, every classroom counts and create an average, right? And then multiply that times 100. Typically SCAT class is on a one to seven scale um, and you normally have kind of a, a decimal points based on the dividing of the numbers. So to keep it simple, we'll take that and multiply it times 100. So you're dealing with round numbers. Um, if you are using an approved curriculum in at least one of your classrooms, uh, you'll receive 100 points added to your score. Uh, and then we'll add your class points and we'll add your curriculum points and that will be your total points. We will have three general levels um, in year one exemplary. Uh, so these are places where without a doubt, you know, even if measured against the national standard are, are truly exemplary. Um, and this is based on the, the class scale of very high quality this will be 700 to 800 points. Satisfactory is our programs that are doing a great job, um, that are kind of represent the middle uh, area based on the class score, and that's between 400 and 699 points. And then those programs where I think where we can generally agree if we were to walk in and have some concern on what, what kids were experiencing and would all feel that urge, that need to help, we're going to classify those as needs improvement um, and really prioritize those for support. Um, and those would be scoring between 100 and 399 points. Um, and again, those are places we think there's going to be a very small number of these, but where we will really need to prioritize, reach out to them, support them, because if it, all of us would probably have some concerns if we were to walk in and observe those classrooms. Next slide, please. Uh, key point here, you'll note if you're for the mathematicians uh, among us, um, you'll say, well, these are not weighted equally. Why did the department kind of land on 800 points? Why are 700 related to class and only 100 related to curriculum? couple of reasons for this, and we've been in consultation with um, uh, some of the national experts on this, as well as the authors of the tool. We will, as we run the data this year, also work with um, uh, statisticians and others to kind of make sure that the, the math is good here. But I think the first of which is, um, you know, interactions, uh, it's, as you'll see, and I'll sort of share in some data, they're the best way to promote incremental improvement. And so we really think of the, you know, again, think about this as like 90 minutes of classroom twice a year. You know, we want that to be the most important element in the system because we know that's the place where educators can grow and we know it can significantly impact kids, right? And so we get that into every classroom. And so that's why we'll make this the top priority. We also know that even in small movement, if we can improve those interactions, can have a pretty significant impact on kid outcomes. And so that's the priority. And I think the other piece has to do with where we start today. And so this isn't a forever thing, but you know, just acknowledging you know, that some of our programs, mostly our Head Start and um, school-based programs, have already had requirements in place around curriculum. And so they're going to very quickly get those points and move on. Um, and we don't want a system that um, you know, creates sort of more inequity. So we think it's reasonable 
to support all of our programs to get curriculum in one classroom. We know, though, that we want to kind of you know, keep it a measured amount of points. We don't want it to be too heavily weighted, knowing that we're not at the same starting point um, in a way where, you know, we really believe that high quality interactions can be happening across the board. Next slide, please. And this is just an example. Um, I'm not going to do math in a large group. I feel like that will make me nervous and I'll probably mess up. But just to kind of give you a sense of for ABC Child Care uh, Center, uh, how this might work um, based on the kind of averages. You'll see that you kind of take all the classrooms are equally counted. We think that's important. We're not going to say preschool is more important than infants or infants, you know, more important than toddlers. So all of those classroom counts. And then the kind of collective average is what's used to uh, determine your interactions points. You'll see here in this particular setting that they're only using curriculum in two classrooms, but that doesn't matter. We'll get the full the full 100 points um, because we would, you know, we would we want to recognize that that's a step in the right direction. And then this would be um, altogether 524 points or a satisfactory a measurement. Next slide, please. So with that, I we started out with lots of charts, and then I realized that probably you know an hour and seventeen minutes into this thing that that'd be the you know in the middle of the afternoon in terms of the sugar slump wouldn't be ideal. But wanted to let you know that we have been working with our PDG communities, um, with our higher ed experts, and with national folks to make sense of the data that we currently have, which some of which is pre-COVID and some of which is from the last year. Um, a couple of highlights, sort of when you say gosh, how in the world Jenna, are you guys going to do all this? So the first of which is pre-pandemic um, in 2019-2020, we were able to get um, class observations done in 96% of our school Head Start and Child Care and Family Day home settings that were participating in PDG that year. So um, I know it feels like a lot to imagine all these classrooms, but we're step-by-step -step building that capacity, and we have real confidence that we can get these classroom observations done next year. Again, it's a practice year, so if one doesn't get done, it's not the end of the world, right? There's not consequences there, um, but we think we have a pretty good track record or in a good place in terms of having enough observers and the capacity to do it. We also looked at that data, and that data is partly what helped us land on these two measures of quality interactions and curriculum. We see that there's a real significant variation right now in what our kids are experiencing from kind of what could be considered lower quality interactions um, to what are like incredible interactions, right? Some of the highest quality really on a national scale, if you were scoring something like a 640, that means that's really kind of unbelievably kind of exemplary interactions happening in those settings. When we look at this result and the, the, the math that I just showed you, our current prediction, although we don't have complete data, and notice that this was, um, you know, two years ago, we don't know kind of the full list of the curricula that will be approved. So it's a really big caveat. But what we think right now is that most programs will end up in, in this middle group, this really large middle group. And we think that's, that's important, right, as we're trying to get a sense of this system. You know, we might find ourselves as a group wanting to differentiate further in future years, um, but that really the vast majority of programs really shouldn't worry about being kind of needs improvement, that the vast majority will be um, satisfactory or higher in the in the practice year. Um, and, you know, and we think that many classrooms are reporting to us that they're using something, um, but this data is, is is fairly incomplete. And so partly why we're going to give programs until May, work really close on these reviews this year is um, kind of, you know, counted a little bit smaller and you know, give you points just for one classroom is our curriculum information um, is, is, is uh, you know, we need to get more information, um, you know, on, on that to kind of fully understand what this will look like. So again, big takeaway is we think we can get all these observations done we know from the observations done already that there's a lot of variety. We also know that all programs have done well. So we saw, you know, family day homes that scored very high. We saw schools that scored very high. We saw child care and Head Start that scored very high. We also saw some of those same programs that didn't do as well. And so it really moves away from saying, well, if you're one program type, you know, you'll do well or not, to really saying, how do we get the focus into every classroom and supporting all educators? 
Um, and again, as we see, we're, we're going a little bit, we're proceeding carefully with curriculum, um, largely because some of that information is incomplete and there's still work to be done in terms of evaluating, reviewing the materials that are being used across the state. We will continue to analyze this data. Um, and again, we, uh, we often share it with some of our PDG communities and, and other partners. So if you're somebody wants to get into the data, there will be future opportunities uh, to do that. Next slide, please. So we're about to sort of pivot into talking about improvement. So we talked about the why, but we said it was really important. It was a measurement and improvement system. I just spent a lot of talking about in detail, practically speaking, how we will measure and um, measure what's going on in thousands of infant, toddler, and preschool classrooms, right, with a real focus on kind of measuring the interactions down to the classroom level on an age and developmentally appropriate way, and then understanding and supporting more of our programs to use and approve culturally responsive curriculum. So how does this then connect to the improvement piece? And if Laura will take us to the next slide, I will get into that. As I noted earlier part of why we're not proposing a, a sample right which a mathematician and somebody who's focused on you know uh, economies of scale be like just measure a sample of costumes that gives you enough of of a, of a perspective on how on how kids are doing but that doesn't help every educator and so we are making investments in setting up the system in this way so that our educators all of our educators and we call you an educator whether you work in a family day home head start faith-based um, school-based um, or child care center-based program receive feedback and support to strengthen their practice. And I think that's really important. We start with a strengths-based approach. We help you identify the areas for growth. And then we're able to kind of get better and better as a system that's individualizing the support, the training, the coaching, what you might need. We want to make sure that that very same information is at our program leader's fingertips, right? And so by doing all classrooms every year, and then supporting them to make sense of that information, right? That helps to think about hiring and their walkthroughs and their professional development um, for their site goals, right? In an individualized way. And at the community level, um, whether you happen to be a professional development organization, a teacher preparation program, you know, an individual who coaches or supports uh, educators, like you also, right? We sort of speak with the same language. We can have insight into programs um, and, and educators' unique needs, and we can work together better, right, with these shared guiding principles, this shared language, this simple but clear and focused way of measuring um, quality improvement. So that's really important. I'll note in a, a second here, we are also continuing to sustain our educator incentive program, largely because this investment in individuals, helping them understand what high-quality interactions look like evaluating them sort of twice a year, providing that feedback, all of that investment walks out the door if our educators walk out the door, right? And we know we have teacher shortages in, 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 in our school system, but we have even more pronounced turnover challenges in our child care space. And so really sort of directly funding educators to stay is also part of our, of our strategy because you can train her up to on kind of class, you can do the observations, she can understand her strengths, she can be making improvement, and if she leaves to go take a job at Target or Walmart, poop, you're right back where you started, right? Um, and that's not great for kids either, because that relational piece of being able to really connect with their educator also walks out the door when she does. So really kind of key, both sort of supporting a system where we're getting information to every uh, educator, and we're trying to keep, particularly our child care educators, in these settings. Next slide, please. Another way of, of sort of sharing this, right, and how this benefits all educators is in this sort of cycle of improvement. And so I won't read every word on the screen here, but the key thing is you start with making sure everybody understands um, how the measure, how the observations will work and what it means for them, right? We're getting into every infant, toddler, and preschool classroom, consistent information, right? Actionable feedback starting with strengths, really focusing on what they're doing well. We know everybody who's working so hard out there um, is that, um, you know, we want to recognize that first, right? This is not about a gotcha and what you're not doing. This is first recognizing the incredible work that you're doing with kids. And then laying out how you can be better at that, right? How you can be better tomorrow than you are today, right? With sort of clear opportunities for growth. 
we then need to step in with that individualized support, moving away from the one size fits all to like, what do you do well? How do I build on your strengths? Where are your challenges? And how do I support you to grow? And then as a system, continually getting this data, getting smarter and smarter as a system um, and making sure um, that we are kind of all growing. We're growing in the classroom level, at the site level, at the community level, and then at the state level, right? So we're seeing year over year improvement. Next slide, please. And we talked a lot about earlier looking at some of the, the research on the kind of the tools themselves. Um, we also have looked at sort of some other research on improvement. And so I wanted to just highlight when we set up a similar program in, in other states that having this uniform approach, and there's not a lot of states that are comparable, right? Many states, the measurement and improvement systems are opt-in, right? And so we don't fully know what it means for all programs, because oftentimes some of our programs that serve our most vulnerable kids and families are furthest from opportunity, furthest from resources, and we just don't know kind of what's going on, how much they are not growing, kind of what challenges they're facing. Our system will include everybody, um, and that can be some real challenges in the beginning, right, in terms of like why, what's happening, what does this mean for me? But in a similar state um, where they also had a required measurement and improvement system, what we found was measuring everybody, speaking with a common language, focusing on both sort of incentives and supports for folks to grow. You saw year over year growth across the program. So this is a state that uses only class and its measurement and improvement system. The red line is the average class scores. You'll see these are in decimal points because they did multiple times 100. So kind of imagine that again in Virginia, it'd be times 100. But you see growth in schools, you see growth in Head Start, and then you see the most dramatic growth, honestly, in childcare, right? And again, um, this was not just those programs who wanted to opt in and do better. This was everybody that was taking public funds. Um, and so, you know, year over year, improving interactions, right, at big scale, right, across 1,600 programs and roughly 6,000 classrooms. And so um, we think this is really promising. If you want, there's a link here if you want to look at some of this, this research, but really making sure when you move to all programs, it means you carry a real obligation to support all programs and seeing this happen in another state and seeing how they were able to support growth, in fact, the most growth in childcare, which also has, um, doesn't have a bachelor's degree requirement, right, has majority um, black and brown educators, right, often who face those same turnover challenges and are undercompensated, under-recognized. The fact that they experience the most growth, I think, gives a lot of um, hope and excitement for the work that we can do here in Virginia. Um, and not to just have it in the words of another state, wanted to, uh, to bring it home to what our own educators are saying about particularly teacher-child interactions. And so this is a survey, again, using these communities who have been leading the way for us, 2,000 educators across the state last fall. Um, and what they sort of reported to uh, the University of Virginia um, is that one, they across the board, so orange is centers, dark teal is school, light teal is Head Start, lighter orange is FDH or family day home, across the board reported that high quality teacher child interactions are a priority for their site, um, almost near universal kind of agreement there. We are making progress in terms of them understanding what the class is. And then most importantly, particularly for our programs that were in person, right, on the front lines for the greater part of last year, four out of five of them are saying that focusing on this tool, even during the pandemic, was important, right? Making sure that educators get feedback was important. Making sure that educators are supported to kind of understand what they're doing well, right, even during a time of crisis and supported to grow was useful. Um, and I think that. With that point, I think is really important as we go forward. This year is practice. We know we still have a lot of recovery to do, but supporting our educators, recognizing their strengths, helping them grow, and really making sure when I think about all of the emotional needs, and I will say when my five-year-old came in here earlier, she was very calm, very respectful. That is not always true, right, based on the very big sort of things that are going on for her in her disrupted life in this last year. And we know that our centers and homes, our head starts and our schools, we are continuing to deal with lots of behaviors, right, that result from all of the stuff that's going on for kids. 
and finding a tool that supports warm and responsive interactions, thoughtful, proactive management of infant, toddler, and preschool behaviors, and age-appropriate support for critical thinking and learning is really useful, and our educators believe that to be true as well. And so a really important data point as we go into supporting the use of this tool in the next year. Let's go on to the next slide, please. So want to briefly talk about the investment to help us do this, right? No good things come for free. And so if Laura will take us to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the funding. So we know we need to put our, as the first lady says, our money where our hearts are. Um, so we will, through the preschool development grant, fund communities to build the relationship to conduct the observations and to support the educators. We are looking to in, uh, increase the rates going to programs in recognition of the additional expectations. So the VPI rate has gone up. We've worked very closely with the Early Childhood Foundation to restructure the mixed delivery rates, get those higher, closer to the cost of quality. And we continue to look at the child care subsidy rates um, and increase some of the those resources, as well as, for example, kind of increasing the rates for some of our unlicensed or family day home programs. We don't control the Head Start funding, although I know um, that there are some additional resources coming out to Head Start's first priority is health and safety, but then kind of, you know, hopefully sort of supportive at this time too. We are looking at strengthening the improvement resources. I know many of you are partners in this work, but really looking at how we take the federal and state funding to support the instructional and the social emotional supports, in particular this year, the social emotional supports. Um, thinking about like things like mental health consultation. How do we make curriculum affordable? Um, we do not want folks running out in droves to purchase curriculum. And as I noted earlier, continuing to incent our childcare and family day home educators who are working 30 hours or more a week with kids in publicly funded programs. And we did a study with UVA that showed that we reduced turnover by half in places that received the funding relative to those that, that did not was through a lottery type approach. And so really figuring out how we double and even triple down on this investment and make sure that for educators, this measurement improvement system feels supportive. They get feedback, they get foundational training. If they don't work in a school setting, they get resources that don't fully close the gap in compensation, but at least help keep them in that spot and address um, those uh, those key financial those acute financial pressures that might um, drive them to leave when we know you've invested in them we've invested in them and kids are invested in them um, so we will be providing lots of money here there's a chart that will follow um, that includes all of the, those resources but we recognize the importance of investing in this work if we want it to be successful next slide please Laura So again, this just gives you some sense, so many letters, so many numbers, but just knowing that we're funding each level of the system, communities to get the work done, programs at a higher rate, the improvement resources to kind of address the challenges that are gonna come up and make sure that folks can access those individualized supports. And even to our educators who are doing this work directly in recognition of their tremendous work and that we, we need to keep them there so that, that the sort of shared investment doesn't walk out the door over a billion dollars to sort of ballpark. Um, so it's pretty, it's a both, it's a really exciting time in early childhood. It's hard to say that because it's been such a brutal past year, um, but we are hoping to kind of find that light at the end of the tunnel and be able to support our programs to build back better. Next slide, please. So with that, that marks the kind of formal end of my presentation. I, um, if you want to wiggle it out a little bit, um, take a break. I know I see Cecilia doing that. Uh, I wanted to briefly share with you some of the feedback we've gotten so far, uh, and then we will um, open it uh, open it up for discussion. Laura, if you take us to the next slide. So we um, we have a formal public comment uh, kind of email address. We're still working to refine. We did not receive formal comment through that this time, but we did post a survey in response to the webinar that I know many of you attended last week, and we've already received um, over 60 comments. That is still out there, and I'll talk a little bit more about that 
in a second so we can make sure to kind of get that feedback and we're more than willing we'll figure out how to get that all to you um, as well but wanted just to highlight what we have heard so far so some of the strengths that folks have recognized in completing the survey folks appreciated the common and consistent expectations for all programs right the sense of us all being in it together um, people really appreciated the practice time and noticing how important that is, right? I mean, even for those of you who have sort of sat through the last hour and a half or read these documents, it's a lot, right? And we just need to give time for folks to understand it, make sense of it, understand what it means for them and for their program. Um, people appreciate the focus on teacher-child interactions and the use of class, as well as kind of reducing some of the barriers so that we can truly recognize, particularly our childcare and family day home programs, you know, as high quality, um, really kind of reducing those barriers. The effort to ensure equity and how we're trying to keep that forefront of our process, right, and measuring those outcomes, the focus on our publicly funded programs that serve our most vulnerable kids, and that it's a fairly simple system. It doesn't probably feel that way in this immediate moment, considering I've spent the last hour and a half talking to you uh, about it, but that, that was a kind of a general takeaway. Still many questions and concerns, and I'm sure that they've also popped up in the chat today. You know, just everybody wants to get into the details, right? Which is understandable, right? And that's why you have to have the practice here to kind of understand what it means for me, for my program, for my community. How will you communicate this to programs? How will the curriculum approval process work? How will you support my program? You said there's no consequences now, but are there going to be consequences in the future? What does that mean? You know, how will what, what incentives will be available? Like, you know, how how will the site you know, the scoring work for my site? So just I think this reminder that we're going to need to continue to to hold hands right and support our PDG communities as they pilot this work in the next year. I think folks said please don't reinvent the wheel, right? We really appreciate the kind of continuity here um, and want you to build on existing partnerships. And we think that's really, really important, right? The relationships that folks have and that we're, you know, we're trying to kind of do this in the Virginia way um, and build on what we've learned and what we've established in the past. Remember the importance of our family day home providers. And I think you've heard me talk about that a lot today. This is this is really new. Um, using Link B5, bringing our family day home providers into PDG was a really big deal. Um, and I see Cheryl popping out with some um, some supporting uh, advisees and consultants in her in her in her um, screen. And like really important that we recognize and support these essential educators right as part of this system they play a key role like our other programs do in preparing our children uh, for success flexibility is important all programs are different right when you think about 6,000 programs and 10,000 classrooms educators are different and families um, have different needs more funding is needed for school divisions we talked a little bit about that we know more resources are coming um, we need to make sure we are ling linguistically responsive, right? And we get these materials into other languages. We were just talking the other day, and Cecilia, I think you'll appreciate this, about putting some of these class resources um, in other languages, right? So that even if your observation is in English, but like sometimes it furthers your understanding if, you, if it's easier for you to read materials in your own language, right? Even if you're sort of teaching, you know, in English. And so thinking about how we can support educators um, to make sure that, that these materials are available in other languages. Concerns about compensation. Um, we know the incentive program doesn't fully close the gap. We know our providers, um, you know, sort of are, are already kind of planning for the increases in minimum wage. What does all of that mean? Um, concerns about the cost of class. Will the state continue to kind of cover those costs? How do we make sure that's um, affordable? And then how do we, you know, bring parents along? I mean, obviously, no parent wants to sit through. What I've just gone over in the last 90 minutes of thinking what, what aspects of this do we want to share with families? We'll be thoughtful about that. I will say um, that you know, when we say we don't we don't want to make these public, like they're they're not practice, right? If the, if parents are able to to use them and to kind of to make decisions based on them, so we will we'll want to engage families broadly over the next few years, but want to be really clear that we are keeping these private in the beginning so that they they feel like they're practice, right? Because we know right now um, that. Um, you know, that that's, it, it wouldn't be fair to kind of put these on a website um, and say that there's that, you know, that, that, that parents should look at them, um, you know, until we feel like all of our programs have had ample opportunity to practice and to feel comfortable with the resource. That said, we can begin the work now and thinking about how we talk with parents about 
why interactions matter um, and, you know, why use of curriculum matters. Curriculum also is not worksheets, right? I mean, you know, that's also one of the things too, right? Helping to reset parents' expectations around what high quality learning looks like. I often hear from directors who are like, can we make sure that we do some public awareness that worksheets does not mean learning, right? That there are, that kids can be playing and learning, right? In fact, that's the best way for kids to learn. And so that was really good um, feedback. I often have this conversation with, with my husband when he first started looking for childcare for, for our children and sort of this getting him away from thinking what really matters is sort of how fancy the outside of the building is or the playground, right? And what really matters is what you observe when you when you pop into those classrooms, right? And the warmth and caringness of those educators, right, is is far more important than any some of the of the kind of material goods. And so that's a really important piece of feedback for us as we think about um, how we engage families um, and be sharing kind of if this is what we think that is that matters most, right? And we are all about growth and sort of improvement. How do we share those same messages with families? So with that, that's a summary of the public comment. Uh, let me pause there and then sort of open it up and see um, this, what kind of questions we have. I'll start with the, uh, the chat section, um, and then we will go from there. Okay, I got to get through the congratulations to Shaiki first. <laughs> Okay, so one of the, the points that was raised um, is the um, critical piece around turnover, right? And again, we um, acknowledge that. I will say that's part of the reason that um, we also did not include credential in this system. We know that, you know, it's hard enough to kind of get the right credential of educator and then, you know, she leaves. I know that is still a requirement for our school-based programs, but it will not be included as a requirement um, as part of the system. And it is something we will continue to really look at. We have the ability through the Link B5 to really measure and pay attention to turnover. And so Superintendent Wolford, thank you for sharing that, that, uh, that question and concern about turnover. It is something that we will continue to monitor. We did in our first year of the Educator Incentive Program provide funding to teachers. It did not have an effect in terms of turnover. And so we've, we've really prioritized resources for our child care and family day home educators because we saw a much more significant effect. So I'm not saying that turnover doesn't happen, um, but you know it's a slightly different um, sort of set of, of circumstances in terms of turnover in pre-K-12 schools relative to child care. Shaki asked, speaking of the incentive, will new teachers receive the incentive as turnover occurs? And so we are working, we're continually working to restructure the incentive. We were able to get it into the governor's budget. We were able to get relief funds to support it. So we will have the incentive program next year, um, and we will make sure that educators who are participating in the practice year have access to that. Aaron shared some of the insights there. Jennifer asked about substitute teachers, um, and Erin shared with her. So she said, basically, if you are a long-term substitute teacher, that's sort of, you know, two or more weeks, you are included. Um, we will kind of, as part of our protocols, if you have, you know, if it's a, you have an observation on a random Monday, and that's a substitute just for that one day, um, we wouldn't do the observation. So it's really only the situation where you have longer-term subs um, who are truly kind of... They may not be the official teacher of record, but um, they are kind of, you know, functionally the educator for that classroom. Um, and again, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look at that data as we go forward. Roberta said, I would like to see parent engagement built into the language of the proposal in some of the sections. For example, could parent engagement be reflected in the guiding principles where the number of classrooms and programs are identified? Ultimately, it will be essential that Parents and families across the state recognize and value the importance of the system. There may be other way, other areas where it would be wise to incorporate language we're referencing families. Roberta, that is great feedback. And I think certainly um, one we can think about um, adding in both to the document and to the presentation. You know, uh, we absolutely want families to understand um, what we value, right? And, and and that's kind of what's what's currently embodied in those principles. And then as we get to a place, right, when this is no longer practice, but we want to share it with families, um, you know, thinking about how we engage them, right, at the program level, 
um, at the community level, um, you know, and at the state level is really, really important. I'd like to use this as a moment just to share a kind of insight um, on these kind of measurement and improvement systems. I think when they were first started, um, and this was around the time where we had things like Yelp arrive and all these ideas of like ratings and reviews to kind of guide choice. And so a lot of the, not so recently, but a lot of the kind of original measurement and improvement systems or the quality rating and improvement systems as they were called, were sort of this idea of like, you'll get a rating and then we'll, you know, we'll encourage parents to kind of choose across programs. And I think as a field, we've really shifted away from that, right? The sort of idea of kind of, um, it's not great to kind of to pit programs, whether intentionally or inadvertently, you know, kind of against each other, right? We, we have a diversity of programs, we have a diversity of families, and it's really about, you know, finding something that makes the most sense, right, for your children, right, for your neighborhood, for your, for your needs. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we, 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 we take that pretty seriously as we think about how we will engage families, that this is, is less about, you know, kind of, you know, sort of choice across programs and more around how do we make sure that everybody who's publicly funded, right, meets a certain level of quality, right, so that there's no wrong options for families, particularly those families that need to rely on public resources, and how do we sort of share the incredible assets that family that programs are bringing, whether it's a family day home, church-based preschool, school-based program, or Head Start, um, and really kind of use that engagement to help families understand quality, feel engaged, feel responded to, right, culturally and linguistically, um, and, and get excited about programs rather than any kind of, you know, artificial choice or any kind of creation inadvertently of, of competition. Um, that's a really good point and some feedback there. Uh, Kia asked, who will be the class assessor as observers? How will they be chosen? So Kia will provide flexibility to localities in the beginning to do that. So it's a little bit different from typically how class is used where it's like complete outsider um, but, you know, it could be somebody who's at the site, it could be a local coordinator, um, communities will take different approaches, all of the observers will have to be uh, trained to reliability, have to be certified by Teachstone, which is the company that oversees that. Um, we will be somewhat flexible in our requirements. Um, what we found, for instance, we've had some conversations about equity with um, observers. And so one of the things, um, and I did this, I was guilty of doing this in another state where sometimes folks will say, well, we want the observers to have a bachelor's degree in early childhood. Um, and what we know about who has access to bachelor's degree and who doesn't, if you do that, you can end up with a overly white pool of observers, um, right? Just because of sort of who currently has access to a bachelor's degree. And we don't necessarily think that that makes sense. Um, if you are can be determined to be reliable and you're a very strong observer and you're great at providing feedback um, and you don't necessarily have a bachelor's degree, like that's fine, right? You might be more representative of the community. You might be a more effective provider of feedback and support. So you will have to be determined reliable by class. You will have to pass that um, observation test, but we will provide quite a bit of flexibility in the beginning to make sure that we're not inadvertently limiting uh, the pool or kind of creating some inequities and in who the observer pools are. Jennifer asks, are the communities that are applying for the PG this spring going to be in practice year one if they get the grant or they begin the work in practice year two? Jennifer, we will encourage cohort three to participate um, this year. So if you get the funding this year, we'll get you started. We'll be very flexible um, in terms of kind of getting those observations done in that piece, but we will encourage you to participate. Sandy asks, is the expectation that the administrators of the programs will provide individualized feedback and ongoing coaching to the teachers? Uh, Cindy, that will be places in some places, but not in everywhere. So I think we'll see quite a, a variation in terms of who's doing the observation, who's providing the feedback, um, and the, the coaching and support. We'll work really closely with our PDG community to think about how that will work in their community, um, but there will be some flexibility there, noting the different needs of communities, the different resources. We will work with everybody who receives um, quality improvement dollars to kind of think about how they can plug in here. Um, I know it's something we've been doing for the resources, the T-Tax, uh, the funds that go to advancing effective interactions for VPI classrooms, 
the resources that go out to our infant toddler support network. So we'll kind of we'll want to make sure that everybody plugs in um, so that there's a, a, a wide array of supports uh, when you think about kind of how you get those that, that coaching and those other supports. Vivian asked a great question about uh, those programs that use a homegrown curriculum. Many have gone through a validation process with Virginia Quality. Will they be able to continue using their curriculum? That's a great question, Vivian. So we'll do a formal review. We're in the process of getting that set up, but we will need to do a formal review of those curricular materials to make sure that they check the boxes. Um, and that's why we'll provide um, some time and some resources to do that this year. And we're, if you've gotten an approved resource, again, that's why we want to echo this point. Please do not go out and, and purchase um, uh, anything, which leads to, to Kristen's question. Knowing that curriculum review is an ongoing process, is there a list of already approved curriculum? Who is reviewing them? What criteria is being used? Kristen, great questions. Those are covered in more detail in the document. We do have a list. Right now, our list is mostly um, pre-K, three and four-year-old materials. That doesn't mean we're not interested in infant toddler. We just haven't gotten to those yet. So we will, we will continue to update that list over the course of the year. Um, Angela noted it's not a frequent occurrence, but subsidy providers sometimes might serve three plus with overnight care, will be required to participate, would not have a curriculum-based program. That's a great flag, Angela. This is partly why we have a practice year. There'll be sort of unusual circumstances. So if you're serving one subsidy kit, we won't observe your classroom. Um, or one kid only, excuse me. If it's one subsidy kid in a broader classroom, we would observe your classroom. But if it's only one or two children in the classroom, you know, or the home, we're not going to do that. If it's only overnight care, um, we're not going to come and do class observations of sleeping children. Um, so we'll we'll figure out how to build some exceptions. The focus here, most of the class observations, again, generally occur in the morning, right, where there's sort of an intentional focus on learning and development. Um, and we'll we'll pay close attention to uh, where there might be some exceptions that we need to write into the formal policy. Um, Angela said, do we have funds for mature staff to become observers for class? Oh, Angela, I love that idea. When I was in Louisiana, they had a, I, I, I think I would describe it as a mature staff, but they had the three-year-old teacher became trained to reliability on toddlers. She supported all of the other educators, Miss Gloria did, and it was a great model for my child's um, uh, child care center. So I, I love that idea. We will be providing resources out through the PDG communities, um, and that's one of the ways in which they can be used. But again, the whole reason for having all of these local observers is to make sure that you have a ton of folks who understand what good and great looks like and are kind of influencing that um, from every, in every aspect of the system. Um, Jennifer raises a really important point about the future years, right, which is as communication is developed, we need to consider um, how um, business elected officials and other stakeholders were perceived the ratings. And so that's, Jennifer, you kind of predicted what I sort of talked a little bit about is this is really um, something we want to be really thoughtful about, right? It should be a kind of recognition system. We want to sort of recognize growth. This is a baseline year, um, you know, in terms of kind of recognizing where folks are at. But it, we we did things um, when I did some similar work in Louisiana, where we did things like honor rolls to recognize those who did really incredible work with toddlers. We did an honor roll for top gains, right? So folks that maybe didn't score highest, but really made incredible growth over the year. And so we will certainly use these practice years to sort of think about how we communicate. And that's why we will be more private about it in the practice years so that um, we can th think through, you know, what, what those communication strategies are. Uh, Roberta asked, in the cohorts that are already working with programs, how receptive have the Family Day Home educators been to participating? It's been great. I mean, it's, it's certainly been um, a learning lesson. I think we've, you know, we've been, and I see Cheryl nodding, and she'll be like, she's like, she'll, she'll speak truth to power if I'm, I'm off here. But it's, you know, there's a lot of like, what is this at first? Um, you know, kind of what's happening here? Like, what's in this for me? Like, I'm busy. Like, I got a million jobs I'm already doing. Like, why are you knocking on my door? But um, what's been incredible about getting these resources to localities is, again, we lead with this building relationships, right? So it's a knock on the door first. Like, don't send me an email, right? Because I got enough of those, right? And then it's a, like, and it's sort of getting to know the person and then sort of saying, like, what this could, you know, bring to you, right? I mean, sort of, can I bring you resources, right? Let me talk about this tool. 
Um, so I think we're getting there um, with our family day home educators. I know that we've been working, Chris and Becca, myself, you know, Cheryl's been nice enough to invite her to some of her Saturday meetings, um, but really kind of helping them understand how this can benefit them, starting from a position of recognizing how important they are. Um, so we're making some progress there, but we'll need to continue to fund our communities to do that relationship work. Um, Miriam raises a question. Um, I know that there are great efforts in the community level to bring equity during class observations. However, some aspects of scoring in class are not developed to address the diversity of the teachers, children, and or observers. Is there any plan from Teachstone to address this issue? Miriam, thank you so much for that point. We know we have heard this. Um, we know nationally Teachstone has heard some of these concerns. There was some letters and some work done in California about this concern. Um, and we've actually engaged Teachstone um, as well in Virginia. Teachstone, in partnership with the Early Childhood Foundation uh, and with the Department of Education, has done a series of listening sessions across our state. Um, we shared some of these very same concerns. And so we're working right now with them um, on the kind of how to address them as well as to kind of get Virginia data on some of these settings um, and to really make sure that um, we can address the diversity of the educators, the kids, and the observer. Um, so we know there's work to be done there um, and that will kind of will continue to be a, a key point of discussion for us and for this group as well. Vivian asked about external observations. Um, uh, for the external observations that the state will send in, will these be like double coding observation? What are the consequences if the scores don't match? No consequences in the beginning, um, Vivian. Just trying to get an understanding of where they might be different, um, how much of that is due to different days, how much of that, um, you know, sort of seems significantly off. So we're just getting a lot of data in year one, but no, no consequences, no consequences whatsoever. Um, I know that we always want programs to see the need for improvement, but I am concerned that the scoring seems almost unattainable. So and this is a this is a good good point, and you know I hear the kind of concerns there. Um, I think we we rooted the scoring for kind of exemplary, um, you know, based on um, sort of the, the 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 bar set by the authors of the tool around kind of the highest quality of interactions. Um, and we know that that is a very high bar um, and it's and, and, and that, you know, no one, um, no one could question that, right? We also realize that setting a high bar, um, you know, does, um, does make it seem sort of, you know, pretty tough to attain. Um, we also saw though that programs, as I said before, you know, some programs did attain it, right? And so it's this kind of this, this, this challenge around wanting to set, you know, a high bar to make sure that no matter what happened in future years, we wouldn't have to move away. If we've called you exemplary once, um, that you know that that you would, you know, you would continue to be recognized, right, as exemplary, um, and really to sort of note that folks who, you know, who um, achieve that range really are kind of nationally can be considered exemplary, and so. If we saw that no programs reached that in year in their practice data, um, I think we would certainly be willing to revisit that. But in that we saw that some programs did achieve that, um, and different types of programs did achieve that based on the the kind of early data, we thought it was worth it to kind of to to put it out there. Um, but we also we have heard from folks that. Folks don't love the term satisfactory. Um, you know, we're we're open to feedback there. We've also heard, and be curious for folks, that people prefer potentially need support rather than needs improvement. Um, I I will say, having spent the greater part of now nearly um, almost nine years going into classrooms that score very low on the class, like you know. E e there is, it normally causes one to cringe, right? There are deep concerns about what's going on for those educators and for those kids. And so I, I do feel like we need to draw the line and say, if you are below that point, which is sort of based on the authors of the tool and the use of class in thousands and thousands of settings, like we have to do something differently, right, with those programs. But, um, you know, we, I, I would be open if folks felt like, you know, need support was a better way of, highlighting that those programs, you know, need additional resources from either the communities or really from the state, right? I really think it's a state obligation to kind of intervene. 
and those places. So if that's something that folks wanted to make as a recommendation, um, you know, I think we'd be open to that. Michelle raises a good question about um, what role do you envision Virginia quality playing over the next two years, particularly in PDG communities? So we, um, we've we got a sort of a phase out, a freeze there um, in terms of the formal VQ, um, uh, and we can make sure that that gets shared with everybody. Um, and then I think, Michelle, we're still thinking about um, the extent to which, as we understand, kind of, you know, and folks are coming back, um, you know, sort of, and, and we are, we'll move to kind of freezing VQ, how we can um, think about those contracts and those staff and supporting uh, this, this, this effort. Um, Vivian asked the question, one more for me now. Is there any consideration about the use of assessment tools as this evolves? ASQ, VKRP, PAL. Vivian, that's a great question. So Vivian's asking, right, if our true north is how the kids are doing, you know, shouldn't we think about measuring, shouldn't we think about measuring how the kids are doing? So there are two major caveats here. Um, and I will say this having, um, you know, we did include the use of assessment as an informational metric in some of our work in Louisiana. So I've spent some time thinking about this. I think the first is, it makes us very nervous to have any type of child level assessment, you know, that that has stakes at all, right? And 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 when the state requires it, and 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 if it's attached to sort of something that goes to families, like, you know, I want us to tread very carefully, um, you know, because there is not a, you know, there's it's just not really appropriate for this age group and. And already, um, you know, we know that we've had to be really thoughtful with with VKRP about really making sure that it's not connected to kind of indie in any indicator of quality of of the kind of experience, right? What kids receive prior to kindergarten or what were they receiving in kindergarten, right? This is really around sort of supporting educators, right? And we are going to be rolling out preschool VKRP um, to our school based programs. We would like to engage Head Start about if they were interested in using. The preschool version of VKRP. We know some of our um, private providers use PAL, but really want to be careful about do we really want that to kind of become part of the system that we use to measure the quality of programs? Um, and we're hesitant to do that right now while we will, through Link B5, have that data, right? So we can begin to kind of share that data more broadly with you and I think can contemplate that question. The second challenge is that the distribution of kids makes it really hard to do this well. So it is easier to roll out these tools when you have all of the kids are publicly funded, right? So in our VPI classroom or in our Head Start classrooms, all of the kids in the classroom are publicly funded. And so you can evaluate all of them. What we found in Louisiana when we used the kid level assessment in our childcare settings where only some of them are publicly funded, um, you know, the state can't really require our programs to evaluate the non-publicly funded kids. And so you end up with this real challenge of like trying to roll out assessment and you're sort of saying to, okay, educator, you got to use this with one kid and it's really supposed to support you, educator, but you're not using it with all kids. And it ends up being this kind of mishmash of experiences for our programs. And so we, it's not really reflective of all the kids in the classroom, right? It doesn't really then tie like the sort of the active, sort of the, the learning growth of one kid tied to the quality doesn't really kind of fully give you the same um, breadth of sort of data that kind of capturing all the kids in the classroom. So we're we're not saying no forever, Vivian, um, but I think it's something we're gonna and we will have more and more of UKRP data, more PALS data. Um, available, you know, and, and, and there might be places that have it using stages and we'd be willing to look at that data, but we're really hesitant to formally attach that now, um, but we can bring that data back to you all and continue that conversation. Charisse said, would the state considering allocating class stipend to support lo local observations, um, or would the state considering encouraging pre-K-2 to conduct class? Uh, really good point. Um, you know, I think that's a, I love the idea of class in, in, in older um, grades. I know that's something that's certain that's happening kind of around the country, Texas, Louisiana, um, and some other places. Um, we are going to continue to look at how we support these class observations to get done. So there should be some resources in every community to help fund that. 
um, you know, and we will continue to use some of these relief dollars, noting that, um, you know, some of the the behavioral challenges that have come forward are related to the pandemic. Um, so we'll we'll look at that, Cherise, and to figure out how do we get those observations having, and then helping our administrators see the value. I will say, and my poor team has heard this a million times. I had my child and all my children in all versions of publicly funded um, childcare and, and preschool in Louisiana, um, and it was really awesome to have my son in um, state pre-K in Louisiana and have his principal, right? It was a, it was a elementary school, pre-K to five, right? A principal who had zero early childhood experience. She had been trained to reliability in class. She did the observation for those two pre-K classrooms and it completely changed how she talked to us as families, how she did walkthroughs. Um, and again, zero, she had zero early childhood background, but it was a game changer in terms of her getting what should be happening in the pre-K classroom. I mean, how many times, and I'm sure Sharice knows this, right? It's just principal walking, why are they all in their seats? Why are they all like, you know, playing with blocks? What's happening in here, right? Um, and it totally changed her perspective. And she talked to me about that. Um, and both of the pre, all of four of the pre-K teachers, right? The Lees and the Paris came to me afterwards and were like, oh my gosh, the second our principal got trained reliability, you know, night and day difference in terms of how she saw our classroom. So that is a really important goal in terms of all of these local observers and helping our, our uh, particular elementary school principals understand how important it is. Roberta says, I think the proposal strikes a good balance and clear link between providing support and encouraging improvement. Regardless of the work we do, we can always improve and grow. We need support to do it. It's important to acknowledge both. Thank you, Roberta. I, we, we really agree. And, and it's, it's a lot of words, and I refuse to turn it into an acronym, but it is measurement and improvement. And those things go together um, and really um, making sure that this system is built to support and educators is a top priority. Cecilia agrees with her. All right. I like that. I like that. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Did I miss any? All right. With that, um, what yeah. I would want to do. Oops, sorry. Yeah, you have a, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, I have part. some questions. Oh, yeah, okay. I didn't want to use the chat box. I would rather speak if that's okay. I have a couple questions on class and then one on curriculum. Um, the first one on class, you know, I took the two day uh, class training and uh, you know, it was 16 hours of extremely valuable instruction. So I feel like I have an advantage over a program that uh, begins this uh, process who their administrator or their faculty, their teachers have not had any class training prior. You mentioned in your slide presentation that there will be some foundational training. Would that training take place prior to the first observation? And would that be uh, you know, perhaps a webinar that the lead teachers as well as the administrator would view? Can you describe that process? Sure. That is a, a great point, Clark, and, and something that um, I have heard over my years of doing this, right? I mean, the, 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 and for those of you who are familiar with class, like you will hear different perspectives based on how they experienced often their earliest observation, right? And the places where class was rolled out with more of a punitive feel, or you weren't familiar with what was happening, and somebody just showed up in your classroom, like, that's, you know, strikes dread in anybody's heart, right? I mean, it's, you know, um, if you didn't get feedback, right, and just somebody came in and you just got watched and then you didn't know what happened with it, you know, if they weren't strength-based, like, you know, we want to avoid all of those things. So our goal and what we will um, fund our communities to do is to try to make sure folks have access to that foundational training. Um, you know, part of it will providing resources to communities to look at who's already gotten it, who's familiar, who's not. We've already talked as a team as a backstop, right? Some kind of virtual tool that if your your director didn't get you signed up or you got sick that day or something happened, right? That there's something you can access online that is at a minimum provides a sort of a foundational understanding, right? And is understandable to you. Um, we will double check that everybody's getting feedback. We do surveys of our PDG communities. And so we're able to kind of gauge and really ask teachers in their own words. That's where I got some of that information um, about, um, you know, did they did they receive feedback? And we'll kind of work with with programs and with communities to make sure that they do. Um, and again, we'll try. We'll have roughly about 70% of the states 
on board this year. So they'll have that same opportunity and then next year as well. And then we'll really work to get everybody on board for a full practice year so that everybody does get a little bit of that, that head start before this thing is real. We also will encourage, you know, and I think just building on Sharice's point and yours, um, you know, the more leaders who we can get trained to reliability, the better too. What we found is a leader has a really significant impact on your site, right? And it's not just about the formal observation. What I'm struck by when I have conversations with leaders who've had the opportunity to become reliable, like they bring that, what is it, the class lens to all of their work, right? You think about hiring differently, right? Like you might have a really good resume on paper, but, you know, if you come in and you're not warm and responsive, right, if, you, if you're not sort of, you don't kind of have that that kind of that temperament, like you might say, like, listen, this might, person might look good on paper, but when I think about what will be measured in the classroom, they're not a good fit. Um, you know, we think you'll hire better. We found after several years in Louisiana that directors, right, got better at hiring, right? That when you looked at the kind of class scores of newer teachers, like they were coming in at higher and higher rate. Wasn't tied to any particular credential. I think it was tied to what you just described, Clark, is this really keen understanding of what good interactions look like and looking to hire for that, right? Looking to support that day in, day out, aligning your professional development to support that. And so we won't require, I'm gonna say this clearly, we're not gonna require every director. We're not gonna require every family day home educator. We're not gonna require every principal to become reliable. This is, this is you know, we, 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 we don't wanna do that. We, we know that folks have a lot of competing demands but we will resource and we will encourage that because we think it can be transformative for the educators. And we recognize the outsized influence that directors and family day home educators who are both directors and teachers at the same time, right? And principals and our Head Start leaders and the kind of the instructional leaders at all the sites, the more people locally who get this, understand it, speak with that language, that's where we think a lot of the improvement comes from over time. So it's a really, really, Good point, and I appreciate that that testimonial, yeah. Clark. And, um, question on the scoring system. So the the practice year one rating example slide, for example, on the infant classroom in the spring, the average score was 475, 4.75. Can you explain how that math works? And what I mean by that is in the 10 different dimensions of class, um, it's good to get a high score in nine of those 10 dimensions. Uh, one of them, negative climate, you don't want a high school, you want a low score. Yeah. So we're really not taking an average. Uh, how, how does that work? We invert negative climate. So Clark, so you basically, you switch it around. So it, it is, you know, you, it, you know, a one becomes a six. And so it's a, it's a, it's an inversion. So yes, no, it's fully, it's I fully that reflects that. Was, yeah. And then the last thing I had, and it may not be so much of a question as more than a comment, but I know in our last meeting, right at the end, there were several comments slash concerns about the curriculum. And you reiterated again today, do not go and feel the need to go buy a new curriculum. I, the, the point I want to make is most programs, and I know we do this here at, at, at my centers, we uh, assess our curriculums in the spring. And if we're going to make a change, we do the heavy research in June and we probably get some sample curriculums on our desk in July and we meet with our lead teachers. And if we're changing curriculum, we're probably placing that order by the end of July to have it in the classrooms the first of September. So that may be where some of those questions slash concerns are coming yeah. from. As people know curriculum. That's a big change. For programs that takes place months before it's in the classroom. That just a comment. No, that's that's helpful, Clark. I mean, I think that's why we're sort of saying one classroom, right? And we've got a list now of approved um, uh, preschool ones, pre, you know, a variety of pre-K ones that have been approved. I mean, I think you know, we're we're trying to move as, as quickly as possible here. I mean, there's there's two types of, of costs related to curriculum. One is the like the sort of the purchase price, right? And then there's the kind of implementation cost too, right? And so we want to be really thoughtful about um, even if we give you, you know, even if the state is to provide, you know, a, a resource free of charge, right? It still takes staff time, like all of those things that you describe. Um, and that's it's for that very reason, right, that we're kind of coming back to, um, you know, only in one classroom. And so I think 
We will make sure we sort of let folks know what is currently approved. You can check against that list. Um, and then we can also think about, you know, how we can prioritize, you know, sort of sites for review um, and think about if there's folks who can let us know if they are, you know, need to make a purchase. Um, and we can sort of think about kind of prioritizing those because we, we're, we're, um, really trying to kind of to, to, to balance that, um, you know, and if you're using something that works, like we don't want you to switch, right? That's also, that's very disruptive. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, um, no problem. Thanks, Clark. A couple more comments have come in. Cheryl noted about the minimum wage and particularly for assistants and co-teachers. Um, and that is um, something we're really looking at, particularly with the relief funding right now, Cheryl. And so we you know we received some pretty significant dollars as it relates to the relief funding and looking at the federal expectations, looking at this work, um, working very closely with Commissioner Storin um, and the group to sort of think about that. We know the minimum wage increases in March for many people on this call. And so trying to be really thoughtful um, about that, right? On top of this additional responsibility. Roberta, uh, Beverly added in um, the opportunity to focus on a few things um, is, is great. Sandy noted, um, class looks at overall teacher-child interactions would certainly set the foundation for good practices for all children, but we know that there are certain practices that might be need to be used with young children for disabilities. Might we ever use an observation tool like the inclusive classroom profile in addition to class and inclusive classrooms? which looks specifically at interactions with children with IEPs. That's a great point, Sandy. I know we've been working very closely with Don Hendricks and our team at how it's being used in Virginia. I think both looking at the preparation of the educator, somebody who's familiar um, with children with special needs, right, brings that right lens in addition to the, um, the, the class tool. I think we will, we're, we're, we're thinking right now in some of our places, as we think about the improvement strategy, we don't think we'll add another resource, a lot of additional resources across the board, but um, in places where you know there might be a red flag, thinking about what additional supports might be needed. And so this is a perfect example of like I think, you know, do we might we sort of say, hey, you know, we're concerned about what's happening in this classroom. Is this a classroom that maybe needs some additional support? Let's do this additional tool to really guide the educator to think about those interactions with the children with IEP. So I think that will be, um, we're gonna use this year and really look at in partnership as Miriam noted with, with Teachstone to look at some of these sort of special cases um, and kind of think about what additional steps we might need to take to use those. Um, Beverly noted, I love what you all are doing here including all of us thinking about the impact and attempting to fund it all. Many states piled all expectations on the centers without care to how it would be done and a penalty and funding from the state and funding. This is refreshing. Thanks, Bev. I mean, I think the key, the key piece here, and you know, I've heard from you know directors uh, across the board, um, right? I mean, if, if these things are costly, then we're not going to do them, right? I mean, if these things have a cost, it means that I either need to pay my teachers less or I sort of charge my parents more, right? And I think having the opportunity to work in Louisiana, which is one of the uh, most affordable states for childcare, but it's also because that's what parents can afford to pay, you know, was a was a really good place to learn that thinking about the affordability of this, you know, how we make this accessible is really important, particularly for our programs. And I'm thinking of Cheryl and her programs, like they are the most affordable ones for families. They are a lifeline for our low-income working families, our low-income families that are in school, you know, for our diverse communities from Northern Virginia to Harrisonburg to Southwest to Tidewater, right, to Southside. So we, if we are going to sort of champion equity, we need to make sure that this is not unaffordable or too complicated, right, for all of our programs. Um, and we can't have this be tremendously costly because then um, we know that the vast majority of our private programs that take public dollars rely on both public and private paying parents. And so thinking about what this costs um, is critically important to making sure that there's equitable access. Um, Shaki said, yep, great idea, Sandy, and particularly for programs that require a certain percentage of enrollment with IEP. So we're, that's a, you know, a big shift for our VPI program. So something we'll definitely look at this year. With that, um, are there other comments? I know some folks are fast typers. Some people would prefer to talk. Are there any other comments from 
the the group that folks want to share before I think I'll turn it to Shaki to sort of see if there's a way to get an endorsement or whether want, folks want to add a particular recommendation. Uh, the only thing that I would like to say, Jenna, is that I feel that we are in the right path. Uh, it's very important to do the feedback to teachers when we do the evaluations, um, when do the scoring and have the incentives for them. Uh, the turnover is crazy, but I think it's some way we can find um, ways to keep them in their early childhood. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, the turnover is, 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 is really challenging. And it's, I mean, I just, it's not good for anyone. Like name a director who's like, yes, I wanna post again. I wanna do interviews. I want, you know, I want to like pay for the background check and then, you know, train this person up. And increasingly, when we look at the surveys that we've done so far, folks don't want to leave. It's just that they have, a, you know, something they got to pay for immediately and they just can't make it work. And so really um, thinking through how we can use this incentive program to tackle that um, is, is so important, Cecilia. I completely agree. Other comments? All right, well, with that, I um, want to take a moment um, and see, um, and I, I, I think sort of, Shaiki, we're new at this, so we're, we're, we're figuring this out, but uh, what we would want to do, Shaiki, is to see if somebody wanted to put forth, uh, I think, a motion to endorse this. Um, if somebody wanted to do a motion to endorse, like with a particular uh, recommendation, we're also um, open to that. But it would be our hope if, if you think that this has um, potential that we would be able to um, move this forward. It might help before we jump into that. Is there a next step slide here? Becca, I can't remember if this is just the webinar. No, so just one reminder on the next steps and mixing up my webinar and my and my different presentations. So just as a reminder, we will we'll seek your endorsement today. We then go and I present a slightly shorter version of this um, to the board with the kind of the full document that you've received in April. That's the first review. Um, we discuss with them what they think. We will meet with you all again in between that in June, and then we take it back to the board in, in June. So we're sort of seeking an endorsement today. We'll hear from the board. We're still collecting um, feedback via the survey. We'll see you again before it goes to final review um, in June. And again, the way we set up that document is just for the practice year. So this is not a guarantee for the next five years. It's really just focused um, on on this year. So don't think of your endorsement like, oh my God, I'm like marrying this proposal, right? This is just just for the, the practice year. Um, but we would love if you all are open to it to be able to kind of take it to the board and say that we received an endorsement from this group. Jenna, I'll say that um, I think we've learned a lot from um, the PDG pilot um, and we'll learn a lot even any or even more from this practice year. Um, but I think that from our conversations today and our continued conversations um, and input uh, from what we've heard today, that there it is clear that there'll be opportunities to refine this system as we continue to learn from it and or build in supports um, to really make it equitable across um, all of our programs. Um, and so having said that, and thank you for um, of sharing all of this detailed information with us and um, having the platform to really ask questions and get a, a good understanding of what we have so far. Um, and so having said that, do we have a motion to um, endorse the proposal? Jennifer, I move that we endorse the proposal provided to us today to move forward to the board. Uh, Clark okay. Anders, I second. Motion has been made and Chucky, I have a question before we 
you know, accept the endorsement, just around the, the recommendations piece. So how is that, yeah. will that be captured? I can jump in here. So if, if um, uh, so there has been a, a motion to endorse the proposal as is and, and a second, so we can, we can vote. Um, alternatively, uh, if someone has a recommendation that they would like to include, they could make a motion to endorse the proposal, you know, with with a recommended um, uh, amendment. Um, and so, uh, recognizing again that we're all new here and, and learning the the processes together, um, we can pause really quickly to see um, if there was anyone who had a recommendation. Um, or wanted to make a motion to endorse with a particular recommendation. So you would say, I move to endorse the proposal with specific recommendation, specific inclusion or specific clarification. Okay, and this may be the place where it may just be a question. I mean, I, I feel like it's, a, I mean, um, very comprehensive in terms of the, the quality and the measurement piece, but would definitely like to see more on the improvement side, um, really how we are giving that feedback to, um, to providers and actually supporting them um, on the improvement side. So I didn't see as much of that. And so recognizing that some of this, um, you know, Jenna mentioned will be at the, uh, the local level, but also hoping that the state will put together I and mean, then provide some guidance around the improvement part um, of the system as well. So one way to think about that, Michelle, is that you could do um, a recommendation to endorse, or sort of, sort of a motion to endorse with a recommendation that the state provide additional guidance and support on improvement, right? And then what? The, so two things happen. One is I would reflect that to the the board, and then we would probably go back to both our slides and to the document and try to address that, um, and then could talk to the board how we did that. So would you want to make that motion? Absolutely. So I just uh, echo what Jenna just said. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Vivian, and I'll be happy to second that motion. Okay. All right. So we now have a, uh, a sort of Amended motion, motion to, uh, yeah, to endorse with the recommendation that the state provides additional information guidance and support on improvement. Does anybody else wanna add before we kind of have Shaki do a, a, a vote on that? Any other um, Jenna, could I, could, Jenna, could I, it's I'm Roberta. Sorry. Could I ask a question? Um, I don't know how other people would feel about including some additional language on uh, stressing references to parent engagement as a part of this. I don't want to put forward a motion to that if I'm the only one thinking that. So, and then, Jen, I would like to add something to there. Go ahead. Sorry, sure. Rebecca, go ahead. I was just going to say that so we we can um, vote on each of these recommendations okay. individually. Um, so we yeah. can, um, you know, move, uh, maybe what we'll do is is move to uh, include a specific change um, or motion to endorse with a specific change and, and you know, with each um, uh, with each vote. Um, you'll be uh, agreeing with, um, you know, the endorsement kind of conditional on or, you know, with the expectation that the state makes the change identified. And so th these would not be, I just want to make sure we're uh, on the same page that, you know, if, if we're, we'll vote on them individually, but each one that passes, we would then make all of those recommended changes um, in, in moving it forward to the board. Does that make sense? It does, and it would make me feel even better if the first mo the person that made the first motion, if you would retract your motion, um, <laughs> just because we have two on the floor, and my parliamentary mind is going crazy. <laughs> and I guess I just wanted to add, you know, one more thing, one more thing in there. Um, I know we're looking at class, and you know, to kind of piggyback off of what Sandy's saying, because. Now I'm a teacher in an inclusion classroom. You know, Sandy and her team actually provide my classroom, you know, with support. So I would say, you know, my addition would be have the state look at 
least some observation or practices for you know those children that have disabilities that are in inclusion classrooms. And I say that because a lot of a lot of areas are moving to that inclusion model, and we are getting a lot of students, especially you know in our urban school districts, they're coming in with you know either IEPs or certain disabilities. So I just want to make sure that they're included you know, in this motion as well. Okay, so the first motion to endorse as it is, um, whoever made that motion, can you just retract that motion for me? It's Jennifer, I made it, so I'm retracting it for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And, and so the motion that we have on the floor now is, with several recommendations. And Rebecca, what I'm understanding is that you would like for us to approve each one individually. So and I think, yeah, I think that we'll want, um, so I've got Michelle has a recommendation, Roberta has a recommendation, and then Daryl has a recommendation. So okay. we'll go one by one um, and, and you'll just need to say, you know, you, you right. move to endorse um, with your particular recommendation um, and then we'll need a second and then we can vote. Um, uh, Shaiki, if you want to do nays first, just so that we can make sure folks have an opportunity there and then, you know, uh, we can do that, the eyes afterwards. Okay. Could, um, this, this is Sandy. Might, might we be able to repeat the uh, recommendations? We will. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Can we, wait, can we just. Can we discuss them before we, the recommendations? Yeah, right. Okay. That's so, I was just going to comment. Um, I completely agree with Roberta that parent buy-in is huge, and they they need to have the information. Um, but I'm I'm just wondering. This is a practice year, you know, and we have a second practice year, and I'm wondering how much information we, how much full disclosure we want to put out there when we're we're in a practice year when we're, mm -hmm. you know. Trying Kristen. to out, figure out how it's working. working. Um, you know, when, when we're in full practice two years from now, I, I'm completely on board with what Roberta is saying. I wasn't um, really going, um, Kristen, I wasn't really going there in terms of what should happen now. As far as I didn't really clarify a recommendation, what I was thinking is would be a recommendation to incorporate parent engagement in the guiding principles to the proposal and leave it at that. Mm, that's perfect. <clears throat> Absolutely, Kristen. I think that's a really, really important point, right? That, that, that it, it should be a part of the guiding principle. It's kind of a perfect example of something where we're going to tread lightly at first, but I, but I, I think Roberta, that's a, that's a very good place to put it, right? As, as those values that shape our work. Um, over multiple years, but being extremely careful um, in, in year one for the reasons that Kristen pointed out. And I also note that came um, through in, in, in Jennifer's comment. So why don't we, um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, um, why don't we start with Michelle um, and, and Michelle, if you could share a little bit about uh, the the recommendation you were offering, just and we'll pause to make sure no one has any questions, um, and then we can kind of move forward with the motion and um, approval process, uh, and that or motion and and voting process, excuse me, um, and then we can do the same for Roberta and then for Daryl, and then we'll pause again to make sure no one else has any other um, recommendations. Does that sound good, Shaiki? Okay. Okay. So um, my recommendation is that we get more guidance from the state level in terms of the improvement aspects. So like I was saying, I feel like this document um, is very good at laying out the measurement um, piece of it, but not as detailed on the improvements that will, uh, and the supports that will be provided to providers um, after they've been, you know, rated or gone through the, um, the class tool. And so understanding that some of this will be left to localities to um, kind of determine what works best in their communities, but also hoping that the state can provide some guidance, technical assistance and support. Um, so it's not just you've done two evaluations, this is your rating and that's it.
Does anyone have questions or reflections? Um, this is Sandy. I, I agree with what Michelle is saying. And I don't know that we need to ask it because I think you've been pretty um, inclusive of your um, talking about what are the improvements in the details. But I am wondering whether we say uh, more again about that whole details as it relates to individualization, feedback, ongoing coaching. I don't know that we need that to kind of quantify as part of the improvement, but I think those were key components that have been um, put in this first iteration and first practice year. Are we ready for a motion for this first recommendation? Um, so I move that we approve the um, or we endorse the um, the proposal as written with the recommendation that the state uh, provides more guidance around um, how providers and programs will um, be assisted in the improvement um, aspect of the system. We have a second. Yes, Vivian, and I will second again. Motion has been made and properly second. Any opposed, say nay. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I have it and that motion is carried. The second recommendation uh, from Roberta around parent engagement. If we can just get a quick recap of that recommendation. Yes, I was um, moving that we would approve the proposal with the additional recommendation to uh, incorporate parent engagement in the guiding principles to the proposal. Um, that's as much as I would include, and I would leave it to um, you know staff and, and the team working there to decide whether that could be exactly where that would be in those guiding principles. Perhaps it would be in that last section that speaks to the magnitude of the problem uh, and the issue here with the number of programs and the number of classrooms, and I think you know the number of families that we're trying to reach fits could fit there. But I would also trust them to add just um, an individual. Uh, extra bullet if they felt that parent engagement um, merited that. Any other questions or discussion on that recommendation? Hearing none, do we have a motion to accept that recommendation on parent engagement? I said move, I'll make the motion. We have a second. This is Kristen, I will I second the motion. <laughs> motion has been made and properly second. Any opposed? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 I have it motion carry. Third recommendation um, around class. Um, Daryl, if you could review that recommendation again. Uh, sure. Um, so my recommendation was that we, you know, incorporate, or I guess the best way to word it is to have the state look into tools that will help teachers, you know, or to help teachers with their interactions based around children with disabilities. Any questions or further discussion on that recommendation? Yeah, I have a question. Would that come as part of the um, 
additional detail you provide in terms of supporting improvement? So if observers come in and see that, it would be in the improvement process. Is that what we're, so like, is it covered by that if you include that in the improvement process piece that you're gonna add? That we, like. Yeah, I think this, this is Sandy. I think Jenna, uh, when that question was brought up, Jenna kind of, Jenna did say that that could be something in a particular class that was um, that was considered as a second kind of approach to things that they saw some struggles. I, I think I'm hearing Daryl say though that we're back to um, the state still considering to use some observation and reliable tools related to that those interactions. Is that correct, Daryl? Yes, Sandy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, um, I would interpret it, and, and Daryl, please um, jump in here if I, if, I, if I misspeak at all, is I, I like the way it's broadly framed. I mean, and so there's sort of, there's the kind of two action steps that, 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 that kind of pop to mind when I, when I hear him say that. I think the first is to kind of take a look, you know, at the document and the extent to which we explicitly sort of, you know, make sure that that's included and we talk in detail about those um, uh, tools and, and, and practices. Um, and then I think there's also, as part of that, um, and making sure we kind of, you know, walk through that, that being a priority and what, you know, kind of more detail there. Um, and then I think there's, you know, an a, a additional part, right, which, which kind of speaks to Sandy's point in terms of kind of acknowledging like what that might include, right, which is again, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that sort of, you know, yes, we would have class observation for all of these classrooms. And I think, you know, that, but there might be something else, like particularly if, right, it's inclusionary mm -hmm. or if, you know, it comes in and it's sort of a, you know, a, a, a need for concern. And so those are the two things that I would go back and, and um, look to kind of add when I hear the kind of look at the tools and practices that support children with, with special needs. Gotcha. Yeah, that kind of captures what I was thinking, Jenna. Okay. Any other questions or discussion around this recommendation? Okay. Do we have a motion? This is Sandy, I second the motion. All right. Um, I move that we I move that we um, accept the proposal as written with um, with the recommendation that we we include um, we include practices for children with um, disabilities or children in inclusive classrooms. Now, can you second for me, Sandy? <laughs> yes, I second the motion. All right, thank you. Okay. This motion has been made and second. Um, any opposed? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I have it. Motion is carried. Uh, that was three recommendations. Are there any more recommendations? Hearing no additional recommendations, uh, we have. Um, the proposal approved with three recommendations around improvement, parent engagement, and class being inclusive of children with disabilities. Or um, Jenna or Rebecca, is there any other business before we adjourn? I don't think so. I, I'm, I am like, I'm so excited, guys. This is fantastic. I'm already like thinking about these, these three things, um, but it's great. Um, but um, 
really exciting to have your endorsement um, with such an esteemed group. We will, uh, Becca is taking clear notes. We will um, work to kind of take action on these areas and be sure to reflect back. Um, here's what will happen from, from here. Um, thank you all so much. Um, we will continue to post the survey and capture feedback there. And the moment we pull it down, we'll make sure to kind of share the extent of the comments with you. I and the team will take back these three specific pieces and work on them and make sure that their changes are reflected by the time we take this to the April board meeting. So again, that's kind of, you know, we take pretty immediate action on your recommendations. Becca will send you, um, once we send these kind of go to, they go to the board meeting. I don't remember exactly what the board meeting is, but I think a couple of days before it, it becomes public and we will make sure to send it to you. So you see your endorsement, you see your three recommendations. And normally what I do is I add a slide to the presentation that says the ECAC says this, and here's how we have made changes in response to those, um, those recommendations. So you should see that in the slides and in the document. Um, and then we'll see how the board meeting goes. Um, and then we will come back and, and see you all again afterwards. But this is huge. This was so much information. Um, huge thanks to everybody who contributed to this. Um, and again, if something, the other part too, if something strikes you in the middle of the night or there's something else, like don't ever hesitate to reach out um, and, and let us know. But it is um, such an honor to be able to present this. Shaki, thank you for running us through our first endorsement with recommendations and handling all of that with 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 grace and we're, we're making this up as we go and doing this virtually which is a little awkward for all of us but um you know very 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 appreciative of your time um i know this is three hours this is really long um but it's we care so much about this it has an incredible effect on our um, educators and so we just appreciate the time and attention that you did in preparing for this meeting for being here today. Um, and um, with that, I will give you 13 whole minutes back. All right. So don't <laughs> say you didn't get anything um, from us, but huge thank you to everybody listening and, and watching this on YouTube. Huge, huge thank you to everybody who's doing this incredible work. Thank you to our early child advisory committee. Expect more emails from us and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Have a very safe and happy Wednesday. Thanks guys. Take care. Thank you. Uh, we can officially adjourn this March meeting and we will see you all in May. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Have a great break, everybody. Bye bye.